mad ones. I'm your hey, look, my hair is growing back host, Cam Harless. And joining me today is my co-host, as my co-host, is Zachary. I offend people with my necklace daily, Cooper. How you doing, Coop? I do everything I can to as offend as many people as I can every single day. <laughs> every day. I, I am good at offending people, but only when I'm being the sarcastic little butthole that I am <laughs> naturally. It's like I'm going to make a joke that's going to offend someone. So it's like, you know, on Twitter I had a massive wave after that whole Tucker Carlson thing. And like it, it is just like every now and then I make a joke and I lose 200 followers. So <laughs> like, you know, that's who I am, though. It's going to happen. Um, but I'm excited to have you back as co-host because I, I like you as a human being and, and, and I enjoyed speaking with you. Um, I hope that that's kind enough. Um, but I'm also excited. I, I almost feel the same. Almost. Hey, <laughs> you know, one day, one day, one day we'll get there. Uh, but I am excited about our guest today, which it's, it's kind of funny because I asked our guest to come on like months ago and I'm just so many, so much stuff has happened since, since then I had to cancel reschedule, blah, blah, blah. But in the middle of all that, excuse me, in the middle of all that, I found out that you're actually really close to him. And so when I was like, hey, I need a, a, a guest co-host. Do you want to do this with me? I did. I had no idea that y'all were as close as you were. So it'll be fun. Um, so I'm extremely excited to talk to our guest today or tonight for you noobs who aren't patrons. Um, we get to talk angels, demons, the deads and self-taught demonology, which I, I, I feel like that's the only way to learn it these days. I don't I don't know. I mean, well, outside of, you know, going having Michael Heiser as a professor, perhaps, but he doesn't do that. He just teaches it. You're going to learn it yourself. Um, you, but universities don't specialize in demonology. I think demonology is one of the biggest holes in Christian theology today uh, hmm. because it's demonized. Right. You're studying right. the bad guys. And, yeah. you know, yeah. people people don't want to kind of study the bad guys. And some theologies don't make any room for it. Yeah. Oh, that's true. That's definitely well, and, make no room for it at all. Well, and, and on top of that, like you see the um, the people who do talk about it, nine out of ten times are dumb as hell. And so it's like finding someone who's actually looking into things and is being scholarly about it. Rare because I know Lilith is not what you think she is. <laughs> you stupid feminist. <laughs> but uh, let's turn a mistranslation into a major character that we claim was left out of the Bible. Absolutely. Uh, but before we get to the actual show part and I introduce the guest, uh, I just want to let you know that this show is 100% brought to you by fans and patrons. So hit like, subscribe, share the show with your friends. Uh, we've covered all sorts of things. So there's probably something that you want to know more about that we've done a show on. And if there's not, tell me. We'll figure out a way to make that happen. But share share the show with someone who might gain something from them. Um, also, as today is evidence, if you join Patreon, you get to watch or listen to some of the episodes early. So like this one will be early next week's will be early, but since it's Thanksgiving week, everyone's going to get that one early. Um, but we also do zoom hangouts where we play games and you get my eternal gratitude. So patreon.com slash the mad ones. And the last thing I want to tell you is if you, which I, I, I need to tell you something else, but that'll have to happen next week because I can't remember the link. Um, but if you really want to rep us, we are the mad ones.com slash store. I've got some, some cool, I think cool that I designed merch for the show, as well as uh, my joint venture with my friend, Brad Binkley, the black tank club. I think that may be the coolest tank top I've ever designed. And I, it's, it's also very me because I threw in some jokes in that, but that's enough, enough of that. We're done. Hit like and hit like now, uh, but joining us tonight is a dude who talks demons and the dark arts daily. Be it vampires, ghosts, the disembodied spirits of Nephilim, or angelic beings, he's got something to say. Uh, he's just been killing it on TikTok, and he just seems like a great guy all around. So please welcome to the show, Mr. Israel Petty, a.k.a. Izzy-centric. What's up, man? What up, guys? <laughs> I did notice on your TikToks there was a shift, I think recently, maybe I just missed it before, but I swear you've been really emphasizing the L at the end of your name. Is, is that something that's happened recently, or is that just something I didn't pay attention to previously? My dad requested I start doing that. So in honor of him, while he is alive with us, I wanted to continue doing that. And then long after his death, I will continue doing it. That's yeah. something that he specifically asked for me to do. Outstanding. Well, I think it's cool because what a lot of people don't 
seem to realize is that the naming structures in the Bible are often based on names of gods. And so uh, specifically Yahweh, but, you know, Israel uh, means wrestles with God, L being the the name, El, Elyon, El, uh, you know, the big, the, the big guy, Yahweh, before they used the word then they necessarily used Yahweh. But if you look at Elijah, that's Eliyah, which is short for Yahweh. And then you also have all the other um, Canaanite deities who have their own little dudes running around with God names in them. So, I mean, you pointing using that pronunciation and saying L at the end strongly, I think super cool because most people just say Israel and it kind I'm of that I'm from the like, south it's gonna happen i grew up with that and then i fell into it because i'm like well if you're gonna cut halfway th now i'm gonna do the same thing and then one day my dad actually was watching one of my videos and um he watched the uh, angel and demon video my, my most recent one where the high you could tell the production value is actually considerably different <laughs> but um my dad was watching it and he said you know i really love it he said but you need to you need to say your name like Israel because that when when we named you that that was how it was supposed to be said and I was like okay you got it yeah I didn't even tell him that I didn't tell him that I just told myself I was like I will yeah I mean that's really cool because I, whether you were thinking of it or not you're actually playing right into what you do in talking about God and the the spiritual realm and stuff like that so whether you're God you're God. Obviously, your God. Whether your dad was divinely inspired um, to say that, it's awesome, and I, I commend that. So, well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I say that, and this Zach, this started with my tweet that I made, like I think three or four weeks ago. No mm -hmm. such thing as coincidences. No. And since then, mm -hmm. I've seen the craziest crap ever. And I was like, wow. Well, no coincidences. Wow, no coincidences. Like everywhere I went, I was like, this is weird. <laughs> Once, yeah. once you really recognize what Solomon, once you recognize and, and cast off the idea of coincidences in God, you'll start to view Ecclesiastes a different way when Solomon says there's nothing new under the sun. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in, in even getting into there's nothing we could we could theology chat on that. I won't. Oh, I won't my get Lord. Into that. I won't get into that right now. But I do think it's funny. there was another coincidence that happened the other day because I was like, I, I just lost, I lost my job recently. I got laid off. And so now I'm trying to figure out, figure that out. But I was like, you know, maybe this is a good time to do odd jobs and get my master's degree. And I'm looking at uh, different ways to perhaps get a um, master's degree in some form of theology. And so I had applied to, I was in the middle of applying to Regent university and I had two tabs open. One was apologetics and cosmogony, and the other was just theology. And I messaged Coop, and I was like, what is – you know what uh, renewal theology is? Because that's just not something that I have in – I've looked into at all. And he was like, oh, yeah, I know what it is. I'm about to, I'm about to start Regent uh, in the, this program. Uh, and so I, I know exactly what you're talking. And I was like, that's funny. Maybe we're supposed to be classmates. The same cosmogony. Well, I mean, whether you go with cosmogony and apologetics, that to me is furthering my apologetics degree. But yeah, no, well, no coincidences. For me, I like I honestly would love to be able to do the masters and then uh, move on to perhaps ancient languages or something like that and uh, do a doctorate if I can make that work. Yeah. Um, but so it's like really the, the middle ground that masters isn't as pressingly important that it be anything other than, and all those classes are essentially the same anyway. So, I mean, it wouldn't really matter which one I chose. So uh, maybe, maybe we'll just be buddies and, and classmates. Coop. Maybe that's how it'll go. You know, the, you can never downplay though, the constructive process of like you reaching out to me, me reaching out to you being like, Hey, so these are my thoughts on this. And you being like, oh, well, these are, I'm in a completely different class. Right. Well, you know, these are my thoughts. And and so having that that back and forth, man, it, it will be like we're college buddies. That's <laughs> <laughs> another wasteful degree to put on my wall. It'll yes. <laughs> yes. I was just laughing. <laughs> Cam and I were just joking. And I was just saying, I'm, I'm now that I, I finally reached 100 subscribers on my channel. So I'm probably going to put my useless college rag up behind me. Nice. It's like he has his useless college rag up behind him. Completely useless. Completely. Useless. Which I think that was kind of how we first like actually like bonded as yeah, was, funny was, was uh, on TikTok. I forget I forget what you were responding to, but 
you had oh, gone. Oh, wait, well, one second. I, Let me. I, and, and, so I know what it was. There was a, you know, we'll just say it. There was a Torah observant woman. <laughs> and both reaction, Rosie and I responded to her. And both of us have biblical bachelor degrees. Oh, nice. And she called us kindergartners trying to oh, listen to the professor. Her. So we just thought that it was so funny and ironic. It wasn't, and oh, oh man, the minute you drop some with some people with these with these kids out there who are like you know Googleogians and YouTubeologians, the minute the minute you drop the fact that you've got some kind of a degree, oh man, their spiritual pride colors show, yep. and uh, you know you wouldn't believe how many people who cares if you've got a degree, blah blah blah. It's like, I don't I don't care. <laughs> Not <laughs> you me. Care. She said, <laughs> professor. I just thought it was funny I, because it was so ironic. It's like, wait a minute. So both of us have been to college and we both achieved a bachelor's degree, but you're calling us kindergarten. Okay. <laughs> well, I thought, and, and so I was just like, hey, I've got one of those on my wall for no yep. reason whatsoever. Yep. Let, let, let me add on. To so I think that was when we first bonded. That, that was a, yeah, that was a fun moment. It definitely was. <laughs> so let's, let's get into the meat and bones. Meat and bones. Why do I say that every now and then? Meat and potatoes. Because who's eating the bones? I mean, we're not Nephilim. We're not eating the bones. <laughs> so something interesting about the bones is um, that's the way that I relate to occultic texts that I'm reading over for any, for one reason or another, when I'm looking for like little things, I, I say the phrase, eat the meat, spit out the bones. Yeah. But I also say you can't digest bones. And sometimes you will choke on one if you're not careful. Mm. If you, if you're, if you get hungry, I've got, I've got a few bones behind me. Mm. So, <laughs> if you get that's 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 you on something. And that's that's that thing about like someone will say first Enoch isn't even worth reading. Don't mess with it. It's sinful to even read it. Right. Yeah. But it's like there's some meat there, but don't depend on that because it's basically like you, you don't got a lot to work with. It ain't going to fill you up. Right. Well, and that's that's one of those things that when people have asked me, hey, should I read uh, first Enoch or second Enoch? I'm like, y you can, but you need to wait because you're not ready to read this. The, the thing I always say is this, this is my perspective and you know what? Everyone's entitled to their opinion. Enoch is not scripture. It is a restatement in a midrash of Deuteronomy primarily. It's basically, you know, intertestamental literature. It was written in Aramaic. Enoch is not the one who wrote it. He was dead thousands of years before it was written. Right. But the big thing is it's historically important. And the reason that it's historically important is that it shows us, you know, God, I love the, I love the Jewish people. But they try to claim that their, their their theology was not like the Christian theology. But Enoch proves to us that that is not true. Enoch proves to us that there was a time when they had this idea of the watchers, the principalities and powers. So the development, and this is something we're definitely going to talk more about. It's like this idea of sons of God, gods, right? Yeah. <laughs> they're the they're lesser, the lesser Elohim. So they they like the church, the church has developed this idea too. And before, you know, I get too out of control, but uh, the church developed this idea too, of like a polemic of saying, Oh no, there's only one God. And there is only one God because, El uh, because God, uh, Michael Heiser, God is species unique. Yahweh is species unique. But the thing is, is that they build into this idea that all other m myths are false. And that is the real myth. Right. That's, well, that's the real myth. The last show we did, you were with me. Mm -hmm. we, we talked to um, Brian Gadawa. I don't know if you know who Brian Gadawa is. Is he? You you probably love his books, um, but he uh, he was a fan of Heiser before anyone else seemingly was a fan of Heiser, and nice. he he has written. Um, he he says he doesn't call he calls them theological fiction, but it's he takes the the people like there's a book called Noah Primeval. Um, Enoch primordial. Um, the one I just started was um, uh, Gilgamesh immortal. And so what he does is he takes these stories and he puts them in that Deuteronomy 32 worldview. And so you see the actual gods as they, they're building their pantheon and, and making the Nephilim what they are to fight the, the seed of Hava, AKA Eve uh, to try to stop God's plan of redemption of the world. So it's very fascinating. We talked to him last week and, you know, so it, it, this was all supposed to be like October stuff. I was going to do a whole thing. And so three out of the four are just going to be in November. Next week, I'm talking to Justin Marler again, who Justin Marler 
was the guitarist of the stoner metal band Sleep before he left the band right as they were getting famous and went to an Orthodox monastery and became a monk for like eight years. Oh, wow. And so he had this huge transformation and he, and it was all kind of funny how this worked out, but he was like, I want to talk about, um, what was it? Uh, unseen warfare. So it's like, there's going to be, there's several of these in a row, which is, I, I find exciting. Cause I just watched an awesome documentary on Mount Athos and um, you know, whatever, maybe, maybe I'll, you know, but it's really cool. Oh yeah. And what's funny is in Mount Athos, the, there are women who try to get on the Island and my friend Jessica, who's the has been the traditionally the co-host of the show, um, is Orthodox, and she gets so mad at those women. She goes, "That's a place for men only, for monks. You can't go on there." <laughs> I find that so funny hearing that coming from. Isn't women. it funny that that's considered like based today? <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, but let's get to you, uh, is Israel. Uh, so let me tell us about your journey because you know I, I of course stumbled into the ha. Uh, the what was it? Uh, Beneha Elohim through Michael Heiser, and w- went into that world that way. Um, I've always said, literally since I was probably twenty two ish, um, that uh, I I the alien thing. I think that I think that's spiritual stuff. I think that's demons. Uh, same with um, well, I would say ghosts. I know you have a different take on that than I do, but I I, I think that those are not what not actually people but we can get into that later uh but i've always said that these are spiritual situations that these are these are not what people think and now honestly i think it's a very cool not cool a very creative deception that the satan uses in our scientifically literate times to propose the alien seed theory and other things like that to pull people away from god and creation by God by using this concept of aliens, which is so per- persu- pervasive now that people will tell you that you're arrogant if you believe that there are no aliens, that we're the only ones in the universe. But that's neither here nor there. How'd you get to where you are? How'd you become a demonologist and a paranormal researcher? Well, it probably started earlier because I did, I really didn't like the evangelical model. And this was before I met Zach. There was something on up here and in here that was kind of bouncing back and forth um i i didn't like the direction it was going i noticed the church was just never talking about spiritual warfare not not real spiritual warfare it was always like i'm gonna say the title spiritual warfare and then never actually get into it yeah and so i i found i was drawn into looking at people's experiences ranging between youtube all the way through like those fictional TV shows where it's kind of true, kind of not. And I would just compare experiences. Um, and I started doing that in my late twenties, but it was my dad and I sitting down with the book of Enoch that actually got me into what else is out there that can better explain scriptures that are going over my head. And then that's when I always believe the Bible was the foundation, which there are many of my followers, they get lost with that they'll they'll kind of veer off and i'll say uh uh-uh, uh no this is where we're starting let's not forget this this is why i'm here this is what i'm doing and because i i i use that gentleness and respect and i don't i try not to put people down especially if they follow me and i explain look to the scriptures first make sure you have a good solid foundation and then go from there and if you feel called to do it so people will ask me can, can I do what you do? How did you do it? Well, unless you want to bump into my dad and do the same thing I did. <laughs> I mean, there's really no way for me to explain it. Like it's, it's something I was led by the spirit through coincidences. I just found myself getting deeper and deeper. And Zach, it wasn't until I met you. Um, in fact, my first time speaking in tongues in my entire life, I discipled under you about two months later. So that right there, and, and then, of course, being officially married to my wife, because I've been with her for seven years, both kids out of wedlock, all of that to say this, when me and my wife actually got married, we had the, cra- we had the stupidest nothing fights in my life. And I was like, okay, something's going on. The enemy was not happy with us officiating it. I always believe that God has had some level of respect for us being a unit. But until we actually submitted under the authority of God and what the law he placed, right? to be married. It's what the government asks for. It's what you see in the scriptures. 
then that's when suddenly uh, I went I went from third shift to second shift of my job. Third shift was killing me. Literally, I felt like my life was being stripped away. And there was just a lot of craziness happening um, when I find, once I actually submitted to the Holy Spirit just last year. Just last year uh, is when a lot of it started picking up. And then before I knew it, my discernment picked up and then my understanding of the scriptures picked up and it just, God opened up a whole new avenue I didn't even think was possible. And um, I said this recently on a video, uh, Cam, I don't know if you've seen this, excuse me, I don't know if you've seen it, but uh, it, it's me basically talking about sanctification and how in that one year, it felt like five in here and in here because thankfully it didn't age me much, but I felt like some form of my life was being stripped away and then handed back to me. And so it did feel like it took a lot from me, but then God gave me a whole lot of it back. Yeah. No, it I, understand that. It was I, I, I understand that a lot because um, I've told, I've told Coop this before, but um, before this show was what it was before it was the mad ones. It was a very political show, which I don't, I don't do any of that anymore. Um, thank God. God, but I got, called <laughs> out. I got called out by the Holy Spirit. I was sitting in my uh, my grand my wife's grandparents' house. I don't. I think it was near Easter or something. I can't remember exactly. Um, but I was sitting there and I was looking at all the guests that I had lined up and I had all the things that I was setting setting up to talk about. And um, I had tweeted at someone. Uh, something that uh, I know what it was. It was the verse, you know, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. And I had just tweeted the first bit of that, which is seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And it, it was in, it was in response to someone else, something that I saw. So I had this plank in my eye, right? And I saw a speck in someone else's and I tweeted at that person and the Holy Spirit slapped me in the face. Mm. said you're preaching to you mm. maybe, maybe preaching. you should seek first the kingdom of god and his righteousness right that's and what so, the holy spirit's like <laughs> right so so i did that and i changed the show you know we, we talk about more than just awesome. christian stuff but it's it's mostly just me talking about christianity jesus things like that and i lost the job i lost uh, and so I got a new one where I was making half as much and I had this and that happen. And then recently I paused my show and I lost my, I lost this job. Like, it's like all of these things that happen around me backing away from my calling, which, you know, when I was a, a young teenager, I felt God called me to communicate truth. Uh, I forget what the other things were, but I was supposed to communicate truth and uh, when I got that first, when I tweeted that first thing, the seek ye first, the kingdom of God. And when I became completely kingdom centered, like 100% kingdom centered, um, uh, what, what I realized was that I was using my gift of uh, speaking truth. And I was essentially making a ministry out of the worldly things. And I got mm -hmm. slapped down. God's still working on me. And if he doesn't give me some tent making stuff, as soon as possible, I'm just going to be mad at you and you're going to have to deal with it man, because I'm allowed. I've read the Psalms. I'm allowed to be mad. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I, 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 I definitely understand because every time I walk toward the path, things get harder. And when I walk away, they get way harder. <laughs> God's jealous. God is jealous. And what I love about this talk right now is that we're talking about things that seem really mundane, but what are they? They're a reflection of spiritual realities. Um, we, we in the modern world have this terrible notion that there's like some kind of a dichotomy between spiritual realities and the or physical reality. But that's yeah. just not how the Bible's written. First of all, that's not what the Bible thinks. And it's not what all. we are. I think, it, and I think that's a product of our uh, Neoplatonist dualist concept of life. Enlightenment. Yeah. It's, you know, it's the the doctrine of augustine anselm and thomas aquinas you know all all the up and down yeah so i mean like we we are so easy to separate the spiritual from the physical when there is no separation like that in the bible no. dualism not persons and yeah. not in otherwise <laughs> i i i don't know about you and i don't want to you know what but dualism is this term that doesn't exist in the bible we are not dualistic creatures <clears throat> we're not dualistic creatures we are not body and soul we're body soul and spirit because we're made what in the image of god 
who is yep. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yep. So there's not the the physical has a meaning. There's a hundred percent resurrection at the end of the Bible. <laughs> and so I mean, but anyway, can't wait for that. Whew. Glory. <laughs> <laughs> so we i have a feeling this is going to be one of those where we we hit certain things and then we're just going to go off and talk deeply about certain things and then come back so you yep. read <laughs> you read first enoch with your father um yep. did you so when did you start doing the demon studies and or paranormal research you said you were watching different accounts and comparing notes stuff like that what does that yep. look like how did that how did that get started it's almost like when I start looking, well, first of all, uh, first Enoch, when I saw the quote unquote origin of demons or evil spirits, right? When I saw that, one of the first things I took note of when I read it for myself was um, they will forever hunger and thirst. For flesh. They were born on the earth, therefore they will wander the earth, essentially seeking rest and not finding it, which is in the book of Matthew. And when I made that correlation between that now, now this Nephilim is dead, and and it's it's dead in its sin. What it did, coming out of abomination, and now it's wandering, and it's basically the most miserable thing you can think of. Yeah. And here it is. That was one of the first times that I compared it to the scriptures and was like, "This is slapping me in the face because I'm seeing that I'm seeing a connection here." And people are going, "Don't read Enoch," and I'm like, "Well, maybe not you, but <laughs> some of you, some of you should because." This is opening my eyes in such a way that I'm understanding that there's we're we're seeing some really deep stuff. Right. And and th now the biggest problem is that First Enoch is treated like another gospel by some people, and I warn about that against a lot of people because it's just not. You're not going to find substance there like you think you are. Some people think that, but it's just not true. But you can you could line it up with the scriptures uh, parts of it. Um, I come from the belief that First Enoch in its totality is not, I believe it may or may not have had a few other writers mm. that kind of mashed it together. Yeah, that's um, there's scholarly perspectives about that too, yeah. Yeah, and so I believe some of it could have actually been, not, not written by Enoch, sure, but by someone in that time period, maybe, maybe, right? And then others, they kind of added to it from stories that they heard, but it wasn't led by the Holy Spirit because it wasn't something that would, would needed to be inspired. But then you see parts in Enoch where you're like, that feels inspired. And then Jude and Peter surely thought some of it was at least. And so it's one of those things where it's like, I would never, never dare say slap that back in the Bible. But I would say I'm comfortable putting that on my shelf versus the key of Solomon, which I am not. <laughs> because some things are going to attract spirit. I'll read all this stuff on the internet, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna have it on my bookshelf. Yeah. Mm. And I when I got too deep into this, oh I'm sorry, did I cut you off? No, I was just gonna say what's funny is because I someone sent me a Quran just because I wanted to read through it. And my wife threw it away. She said we can't have this in the house. If you want to read this, read it online. Yeah. Like, okay. I All mean, right. as a as a religious studies guy, as somebody who you know, because apologetics is ultimately religious studies, I'd yeah. buy a Quran tomorrow, it, just because. First of all, we did a lot of Quranic studies in the military because we study the Quran because it's a huge part of the culture, and we're not exposed to that. We don't understand their perspective of their society based on the Quran, so we need to We need to have a little bit of understanding. But I mean, yeah, sure, I don't. I obviously don't believe in the Quran, but, right. uh, you know, also it's important as it's important that we have positions against certain esoteric works. Like you mentioned, Kia Solomon, it's important that we understand, um, that there's parts of Enoch that we have to spit out. It's important that we understand, uh, you know, covering your eyes and pretending that it isn't there is not usually a generally a really good defensive tactic. Definitely not. I mean, if we actually had a defense against the dark arts class. <laughs> so, talk um, first of all, I would, uh, I would love to lead that. Just say it, but that's just because <laughs> I'm a I'm a fan of like you know fictional shows like Supernatural and stuff. And but I can honestly see God needs one weapon. I said this in the last podcast I was invited to. God needs one weapon. He has one. All he needs. The enemy has multiple. Yeah. For God, it's nothing. For us, it's kind of a problem. <laughs> right. 
Because if we don't have the discernment, which discernment's like leg day at the gym, that's the one day everyone dreads. So we just, we don't say we did. Uh, that, that's, yeah, it, it'll start adding up real quick. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just wild, you know, because I, you, you, speaking of Enoch, I haven't read Enoch directly because it's, it's just not something that, I just don't have time for it. I have so many other things that I need to read. Like I, I'm, I'm, tr I'm digging into revelation and these things, which is like f fun and something I put off for long enough. Um, but I just haven't had time to read Enoch, but I know that there are definitely things you can glean from it because like you said, Jude quotes it. I mean, if you look at what Enoch speaks about and then you look at Daniel and when, when uh, Gabriel came and uh, M Michael fought the Prince of Persia and he had to fight the Prince of Greece. When you see, hear Paul talking about the principalities and the powers, you realize that he's speaking into this particular cultural context, this particular understanding of the spiritual world. And so yeah. it's definitely something that you should have some understanding on, even if you don't sit down and read the whole thing. Like the, right. the, get the glean the parts that are at least quoted. You know what I mean? Like figure that out. Um, well yeah, it's uh, it's something else too because you can you can go look at uh, Jude actually quotes from another book, and uh, Zach, you'll have to correct me here. I I want to say it's the Testament of Moses or the Apocalypse of Moses. It's something. So, yeah, yeah. Apocalypse, it's Apocalypse it's not Moses. in the Bible. Not in the Bible, but here Jude randomly quotes it as if it really happened. Yeah. Because he says even even um, even Michael. Was it Michael? Even Michael, um, uh, when contending with the devil, he was careful about how he was contending with him. He didn't accuse him is what it was. Even Michael was uh, careful about accusing the devil when disputing over the body of Moses. And he says, instead, the Lord rebuke you. And it's like, well, he that, that comes from a whole nother book. And uh, Jude says it like it just happened, like anything else in scripture. There's one thing one thing, one thing that I think a lot of people struggle with, and they, you know, before I ask you another next question that's going to move the conversation along, is sure they struggle with the fact that in people say, "Oh, this or that was taken out of the Bible." Okay, folks, I'm going to blow up your brains right now. <laughs> in the ancient world, there's no such thing as the Bible. Correct. In the ancient world, there's yeah. no such thing as the Bible. This is the Bible. First of all, the Bible was made to be read out loud all together, all together right? Yep. This is the, the 1662 Book of Common Prayer. This is a Bible in the ancient world. It's a collection of random stuff that's read in front of the people. So in the ancient days, there was this notion of like, oh yeah, we read from Matthew, we read from Mark, we meet, we read from the, we read from you know Ephesians in front of the people. The liturgy yep. was consistent of this. And it's only later on that that um, there's so many heresies that they appeal to Athanasius and he says, okay, these are the only ones I want read in front of the church, which is the 66 book canon. Even the Apocrypha are not read in front of the church. So even, and that's back then, that's not a Protestant thing. So, I mean, people have this notion of like something was taken out of the book. No, no, there's no Bible in the ancient world. It doesn't exist. Yeah. But, well, let me, let me, I was well, just going to say uh, real quick, I'll get right back to you. Um, I was just gonna say I do want to say this before I forget it. The Nephilim as the Nephilim spirits as demons is the one thing in the Heiser that I struggle with. And I would like to talk about that a little bit. Sure, but yeah. I don't want to forget it. So I just want to say that. Go ahead, Coop. I'm sorry. This is this is what's gonna lead us into that conversation. Israel, you were a former paranormal investigator, and I want us I want you to tell us a little bit about that and what how you how you got convicted to be de basically delivered of it. Oh, that's a long conversation. I actually got to run back to the bathroom. Uh, you guys go ahead and come up with a side topic. I got, yeah. I got okay. <laughs> no big deal. No big deal. So how does that strike you? The Nephilim uh, spirits being demons. That's the um, one thing that I hear. And I'm like, so, that... yeah. So my thing is the ancient world witness, like in, if you read about the, the martyrdom of St. George, for example, mm -hmm. And sure, is it partially legendary? Yeah, but was St. George actually martyred? Yes. So do I fully agree that Nephilim are demons? Not really. I'm, I'm kind of in the same boat that you are. But the thing is, you know, uh, because St. George, you know, he was one of the centurions. He was actually a praetorian. He was an, a guard of the emperor. So when the emperor declared that all Christians were to be persecuted and put to death, 
he stood up and said, well, then you got to put me to death. I'm a Christian. He was horribly tortured, horribly tortured. They like put him on the rack, they like drove nails through his feet, and made him walk around. They walked him to a temple of Zeus and, and they said, bow to Zeus. And he commanded Zeus to speak in the name of Jesus. And Zeus said, I'm, I'm a fallen angel. You, you shouldn't worship me because I'm nothing but a fallen angel. So this is the, this is the, and you know, from that, from St. George, we get the legend of St. George and the dragon. And he, St. George is of course a huge saint in the Eastern, Eastern faith. Right. Because his example was of one who was basically uh, Georgian, like East, like Caucasus type of, you know, forerunner of Eastern Christianity right. and um, in the Nicene world. So, so perspectives, perspectives, like we got to look, we got to have a balanced view on this. Do I fully agree with Heiser? Mm. But do I think Heiser's work is, is unbelievably important? Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, so another question that I have uh, that one of the ones that I've, uh, been thinking about is one uh there is there when i first started reading heiser i found a facebook group that was in just direct animosity towards him they're like we love everything you've done except we believe that the fallen angels can repent and won't necessarily and i and so like there are these weird little sticking points that i that i would I need to, I, I, they don't matter quite honestly. Yeah. Uh, but like the, the, one of the ones is a Nephilim having been born a, without their consent of a human and an, uh, a fallen angel if, for lack of a better term, a mm -hmm. Bene Elohim. Um, would they have the ability to repent because of their human, the, their human side? And I think this is something that was kind of looked into on in uh, one of Brian Godawa's books. Mm, mm. They, they were being, you know, shifty. I really like reading them, by the way. They're good. They're fun. I've read two of them now. I'm on the yeah. third one. Uh, but yeah, that, that's a question that's that's in my mind is, are these creatures redeemable? So one of the things I like to think about with that before we turn back over to Israel is repentance is beyond none but not within some. So, right. you know, we make our choices. Uh, people, uh, people bring that up with all, uh, all the time. Well, if we can be redeemed, why can't the devil be redeemed? Well, because I, the, the well, devil do it, dude, do because, it. Because <laughs> Well, because the devil has an even better revelation of who God is and he still made problems. Yep. So the people forget that, God is judging us. God is going to place us higher above the angels. Paul says, do, do you not know that you shall judge angels? So if, if Lucifer is a, an angel, a principality and power, then he had a better revelation of who God is than we do. And he still did what he did and made problems. And, and God, guess what? God doesn't have to tolerate any of that. Do you want to hear one of my pet peeves that you just brought up? Sure. On accident there. Okay, um, go ahead calling the satan lucifer <laughs> did i do that did i say that you did yeah it, well and, and I, I don't blame anyone for doing it it's the common it's the common understanding we don't know like, yeah it's we don't know we, we, we don't, we, we don't know we don't i mean know. you could call him the hush the serpent yeah. you could call him the devil the satan um but i think he really likes it when people call him lucifer and so like i don't want to do that i want to mock the little little bat <sighs> So, well, look at, you know, I just had to refute that one uh, Freemason and he really was, it was real. His, his points were really, really terrible. Oh yeah. He, he really, really showed that he does not have any, he, he, he didn't in, in try to even pronounce any of the Greek words except for pharmakia. That's the only one that he knew. Right. And, and I mean, it just really showed that he doesn't have any, any actual study isn't behind it, him. Isn't it funny though, that like these people will use pharmakia as a means to say that you can do spells as a christian but they won't, they won't apply that to not doing mind altering um hallucinogenic drugs like they want to do those anyway or, or think about the fact that is it idolatry i mean you know magic is necessarily sorcery yeah. and idolatry it was so is idolatry okay there well yeah and it's literally every bit of witchcraft was attached to a pagan god a, a fake deity uh well a, a real yeah little g god but a fake 
you know. Yeah, and I have, I you know, I feel blessed because I grew up in a in like charismatic supernatural Christianity. I may seem like a really rational person, but I've I've had wild experiences with ghosts. Wild experience. I've had tons of Wiccan friends. I was seduced into like a form of Gnostic Christianity for years and years, and I didn't even understand that. You know, I could I could teach tarot, I could teach astrology, I could teach pagan numerology. We should talk about this on another episode sometime. But Bye. in Bye. the meantime, we can bring it back to Israel because yeah. I asked him a question, which is a wonderful tie back into him. Like, tell us a little bit about your uh, your paranormal investigative days. What was it that caused you to repent? You know, a little bit about the te that testimony. Well, first off, I do still do the paranormal investigating. What I don't do is the ghost hunting. And the reason I like to make that distinction is because if someone were to call me tonight, well, I'd be at work. But if someone were to call me and say, hey, I got this anomaly at my home and it's bothering the crap out of me. First of all, I would probably dread it. But I would also know that God said, OK, time to go back now that you know what you're doing. Yep. I was talking to every freaking spirit. I would go. Uh, to someone's home and talk to the spirit for my content. So that was selfish already because the, so you'll see ghost hunters with Zach Bagan sit there and go in. I'll call them out. I don't care. They go in and like, we better take care of the spirit. And then they're like, who hurt you when you were five? And it's like, <laughs> it's good. And then, and then it hurts them. And they're like, it hurt me. And it's like, you're pissing it off. Stop. <laughs> You don't know if it's you don't know if it's human or not, or was human or not, and and so I do like to make that distinction because um, you know there there are I call ghosts an anomaly. They're such an anomaly. Um, they they don't have the kind of power demons do. I consider them completely two different things. Um, but demons, there's a reason I believe that demons can mimic the they can mimic the look of a person, a dead person in particular but at the same time, not be what a fallen angel is. And it's because a fallen angel, like the devil, he can, he can uh, mask himself as an angel of light because he has that light. He always had it. Right. Demons, Nephilim, let's, let's go back to Nephilim. If, if we were to assume that this is true, this is why, this is my thesis on this. They are a perverted image of man, therefore a perverted image of God, because we are God's imagers. So a demon essentially would be the disembodiment of these of an incarnate slap in the face of God. Yeah, it's this thing that should have never came to be. It's perverted have, in every way. Have, so, in, so if we look at it that way, we could almost see because they're born of man and the sons of God. Right. So there are yeah. there an unnatural union between basically what we could call angels, fallen angels, and the and the son of God. It's, right. it's, it's so stunning how like we all know what we're talking about here and i'm sure most people will understand it but none of these words except for some of the more specific ones like nephilim or sons of god are actually helpful because what well, like, angel messenger, messenger. Like, <laughs> like, like none of these words mean how mean the way we use them and it's it, it, it can get real confusing but we're doing good i just wanted to say it's so well, crazy how well, i'm yeah. An angel is an Elohim. That's what people don't know. Angel, right. An angel is an Elohim. An Elohim yeah. is a spirit being. A right. malach, an angel, is a is uh, an Elohim that has been given a task to deliver a message. So once we start breaking down these centuries and centuries of ideas, we come to start seeing that the, that the actual biblical writers had a very different worldview. Yeah. Right. But... So let me let's I, I keep we are just like making it hard to keep going because we're all so interested in this and throwing in different, <laughs> um, but it happens. Uh, but so I'll, I'll just float to you how I think about ghosts, because sure. um, I, for one, believe like aliens, ghosts are a deception. OK, I, don't, I do not I do not believe that when someone sees a ghost, that it is an actual human being. I, I think that you may be dealing with a malevolent spirit. Yeah, like, let's let's say they're the, the disembodied Nephilim. Could very well be that. Um, it could be any number of uh, impure spiritual beings. But I think that the t deception is there 
to yeah. pull people away from God. And I do not believe that you're going to run into your aunt. I think that that's going to be something else pretending to be your aunt. Um, right. 100, I, I just, I feel like humans, I just don't feel like we're reaching them. And I think that the witch of Endor, that particular tableau with Saul, when the witch saw um, Samuel, it was very strange. I don't know if you picked up on this in the text, but it talks about how he was wearing grave clothes. And she, an Elohim seemed to come out and she was terrified. And what that tells me is he was something that she had never seen before. And with the grave clothes, I do think that it was perhaps, shut up, Alexa. Um, I do think perhaps it was a more or less resurrection that God facilitated for that moment using Samuel. I can see that. Um, but I just, That's, look, wow. <laughs> right. When you, the, 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 the grave clothes is the thing that throws me. Um, because I'm like, I, I think that this, the, the surprise that she seems to have on seeing something actually come out of out that is not normal makes me think that she was speaking to something else. And you know, what's, you know, what's crazy about that is that just the other day I read numbers 22 through 24 when Balaam comes out to curse Israel, Balak wants Balaam to curse Israel. So Balak is of course the king of, um, Moab and he wants Balaam to Balaam, who is a, a prophet slash sorcerer to come out and curse Israel. Balaam calls Yahweh the Lord my God. And this is, you know, there's no, is there is no Israel. Israel's not in Israel, Israel yet, right? Moses has not, they haven't, Joshua has not happened yet. They're not, you know what I mean? So this, these are these very interesting occurrences, right? Melchizedek is a priest of the Most High God. And yet, we don't have the, the the covenant of Moses yet. The people of Israel don't live there yet. And yet Balaam calls him the Lord my God. So yet there's so there's these very interesting, you know, and that's another one of those interesting ones that you bring up that I think is really fascinating. That think about the transfiguration on the mount and Moses and Elijah were there. And yeah, who made that that's happen? That's what throws me. That's what throws me. What has thrown me about okay, so I have a friend named Glenn. That's like, oh. Never Very, thought about it before. I've sent I've sent you an article that Glenn wrote. I had him uh, he, about yes. uh, that's materialism. Probably I'm not sure yeah. what article I sent you. Um, a couple of them. Yeah, but Glenn them. Glenn was talking about the transfiguration, and he was talking about the word that's used in the garden to speak about this situation is the same word that's used for vision. Mm. And so his his take on that situation isn't that there were it was literally Moses and Elijah which my question has always been Moses died. Like if you're, if you're taking the, like I could understand Enoch and Elijah, but you know, we'll, we'll get there. Um, but <laughs> what he was, what he, his belief is that the transfiguration was a vision that was sent for the men to see. And that Moses and Elijah were specifically chosen because they signified the law and the gospel that Christ would fulfill the law and the prophets. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. I said gospel. Long Whatever. Long. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Same difference. <laughs> um, no, no. Uh, and, and I could see that, but, but again, back to Jude, Moses is translated. Right. And, it, and he's, and like I said, uh, we, I want to have a conversation with sure. either of you and Glenn <laughs> about materialism at some point. Uh, but uh, like I said, I'm getting off, off track here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, my take on ghosts disagree with me. What do you think? Where, where, where are you? Now? Okay. So, I'm, I'm open to be wrong about a lot of things because there's no expert in my field. There's no expert in my field. <laughs> there's just not. Now, coming off of what you're saying, I can see that. And it actually works with why I do believe in ghosts. But there is some changes if you're right. And you have a very strong chance of being right because this also points to Christ in the resurrection over and over again. Yeah. So we'll say Moses and Elijah. Um, Samuel. Well, so something is, is something interesting happened. This goes back to anomalies. Oh crap! One second. Go, huh? One second. I'm I'm so sorry to 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 interrupt you. They were on a mount. Okay, sorry. Thinking out loud, react and argue with me. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> they are on the mount. Transfiguration happens. Where was Eden located? On a mountain. It was on a mountain. Yeah. The word paradise means garden. It means it's pointing to Eden, a physical location of paradise, as well as probably a transcendent truth in the spiritual world as well, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but it's interesting to me 
that there would be this sort of transfiguration, or it could have been the translation, whatever, but it could be this moment of resurrection where what they were seeing was the future. And Jesus speaking to Moses and Elijah's, Elijah post, well, not Elijah, Elijah's obviously didn't die, but Moses, at least, post-resurrection. It's interesting. I'm sorry, the, the mount thing just, just, oh, just hit me. <laughs> Tim Mackey touches on how time is very wonky when it comes to paradise. You watched it too, Zach, right? Yep. That yep. video? I think Cam loved it. Cam, yeah. Cam yeah, loved stop, that. I think stop, Cam sent that to me. Yeah, I sent it to you. Did you send it to him? I think I did, yeah. <laughs> I watched yeah. it. Well, yeah, and, and that's what's interesting. Sorry, this is getting I, – I love this conversation. Paradise is and was and is to come. Just right, like, already, um, but not yet. Like us. Yeah. Like I was – okay. Sorry, I get excited. So, uh, um, here, here, let's 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 reel it back right. to um, why I actually believe this affirms ghosts even more, but it changes like who ghosts can be. Right. Okay, so you know the Catholic Church. One of many things they were trying to do was uh, explain the unexplained by putting it, you know, like, like purgatory, for instance. Yeah. Where the Orthodox Church, I've checked on what they believe about ghosts. They say there's no yes or no. It is, it's just out there and it's a mystery and we're not going to think too hard on it, which I actually like that answer because that's what I believe. But um, there was one Orthodox priest, I wish I could tell you his name, but it, uh, I, I watched it on YouTube and he was talking about how there was this spirit that kept showing up for 30 straight days and never hurt anybody, but never did anything good either. It was just kind of there. And it was a person like it was these people were talking about it. Well, he was exercising it for, for so many days in a row before he eventually he shifted gears and said, what if this is an anomaly? And then about three days uh, into him praying for it, it he just evaporated. It stopped coming back. It was just done. And it's just one of these weird anomalies where I say, for the most part, I'm pretty much which Zach, you and I, we, we affirm praying for the dead, but it's one of these things where it's like, okay, it's a thing. <laughs> and I don't think too hard on it. The Bible says to not talk to the dead anyway. So yeah, I say play safe and just don't talk yeah. to them. <laughs> well, with, with yeah. praying for the dead, there's there's people. No, no. Does that mean, oh, you think you can pray people from hell to heaven? No, I don't think that. I don't think. Okay, let's not. Again. I've, I've the, prayed that my dad's having a good time with Jesus. I mean, there you go. The dead are praying for us. The, the First of all, if yeah. anybody is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. And they have life and more abundantly. They're more alive in heaven than we are right now. Let's be very yeah. clear. True. So uh, they had, they did, did they stop having the Holy Spirit? Did they stop having the power of discernment through the Holy Spirit? No. The book of Revelation says, how long, O Lord, how long until you come and avenge our blood on the earth? Because they're seeing everything. The the notion that Paul, Paul says, or whoever writes Hebrews, therefore we're surrounded by the cloud of witnesses. Yeah, Hebrews 12, 1. And uh, which I don't remember, but which I don't remember which Timothy it was. But uh, I'm sorry, but anybody who I, I've prayed for people, uh, one of my dear buddies who's a fellow Marine and unfortunately... DBI snorted some coke, snorted some uh, cocaine laced with fentanyl. Didn't wake up. You know, God rest him. And you know that in itself is a prayer. First of all, uh, <laughs> rest yeah. in peace is a prayer. First of all, but second of all, Paul very clearly prays for Onesiphorus, who is dead. Yeah, very clearly. That's that's in the canon. That's not some kind of extra canonical stuff. He says, yeah, "I yeah. pray that he will find mercy in the day of judgment." So it's not, you know, it's not some kind of a wild, it's just a historical practice of the church. It's not something that's like, oh, how dare you do that? Well, Paul does it. So, I mean. Right. So let's, let's put this together and let me say this. If there was a dead person, first of all, I would be, command, I would be commanding in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth to <laughs> yeah. go away. But if this thing weren't to go away, I wouldn't look at it and say, what are you trying to tell me? I've been down that road. Don't do that. Instead, I look up and say, God, what are you trying to tell me? And so what I do with dead people, anomalies, is that's in God's hands. He is controlling that entire process. And what if, nothing new under the sun, like you said, it is in scripture. What if dead people in general, when you see them, it is pointing to the resurrection over and over again? Perhaps. It's just another miracle. Right. It's just like the, the common understanding of ghosts. 
and demons would be a perversion of that. Absolutely. Uh, the common kind of the common understanding of ghosts is that they're uh, human spirits who are stuck or who have been who ha have something left to do before they can be released into the ether or whatever. And it's like, I just don't my, my thing when it <laughs> yeah. comes to ghosts, when I say I, I don't think there are ghosts, I'm being saying very specifically, I don't think someone's caught in the cogs of God's creation. I don't think that they just got lost and in the middle of nowhere and they're wandering. Um, I think that it would have to be a pre-existent spiritual being in that way. However, seeing the future, such as in the um, potentially in the transfiguration or seeing a resurrected um, person, like I think that the witch of Endor saw, that's a different situation. But like ghosts, as people understand them, I, I'm just like, nah. <laughs> but don't talk I to me. I can actually elevate this even further. Jesus died for the sins of humanity, past, present, and future. And paradise is this place where it's in the future, but also now. And then we're seeing these anomalies of people. <laughs> Maybe praying for the dead gets a little bit more complicated there, but also a little more simplified. Yeah. Maybe, Zach, maybe. But I'm just saying, it, it's very interesting. And it keeps the juices flowing up here for me. But I'm thinking a lot of Tim Mackey right now. And uh, because... He talked about paradise not being now, but in the future, past, and all of this. And right. when I think about what if anomalies, ghosts, are these uh, disembodied uh, believers who, yeah, maybe they needed something. They don't need something from us, though. That's the difference. It starts getting heavily paganistic when we think, they're kind of ignorant, too. Oh, there's something I can do. You're dead, bro. I can't do nothing for you. Yeah. I can't do nothing. If, if a dead person is popping up in front of me, I'm praying to God immediately. I'm like, Lord, okay. Yeah. What, what do I do? I need to repent about something. This, this person's here. What do I need to do? Yeah. Well, what me, I need to not do is talk to that dead person. <laughs> let, let me bring up, which, you know, I, I, I saw a video of yours, uh, Izzy, and I, I watched a couple of seconds for of it and then stopped because I knew I wanted to talk to you about it. And I didn't want to know what you we're going to stand it. I just sure, wanted to sure. be able to, I wanted to unblemished be able to tell you what my thoughts have been for a while and we can talk about it. Um, okay. uh, vampires. Ooh. These other, these other creatures in our myth, our cultural mythology. Yeah. Um, I find fascinating. And uh, in the past, I have said that I believe that the concept of vampires and what they are and how they function, minus some of the dumb pop culture stuff, but like the little things here and there, the, the feeding on human blood and flesh, the life of a, of a person. Uh -huh. um, and then the fact that for, in a lot of our um, mythology, they can only come into your home if they are invited. Yep. I believe very firmly that these are mo these monsters are our translations of certain demonic or impure spirits. Because yes. I, as as a Christian, and I think you know, as people, maybe even I haven't. I'm not like deep into demonology or paranormal stuff. I have, I believe very much that you have to actively partake to have a demon enter you. Yeah, you have to invite them into your home, as it were. And so I do believe that these these cultural myths are the translations of spiritual realities over time that have been turned into monsters that we see in movies and in television shows. Well, you're big on Twitter. Did you see my tweet about Mesopotamian vampires? I didn't. I need to look it up now. Mesopotamian vampires in, Me in ancient Mesopotamia, they essentially believed that when people died a horrific death, think like the grudge, right? The creepy thing that they think they thought um, and because in, in Japanese uh, mythology, they kind of believe the same thing. When someone dies a horrific death, they come back as a vengeful ghost. Right. Well, Mesopotamian vampires are this idea that, oh, if this person died a horrific death, there's a gust of wind and that might be them. And they're going to feed off of you, <laughs> which is basically a demon. And that goes all the way back to ghosts and demons getting mixed up together. Why do demons like to portray themselves as ghosts is because ghosts are actually an anomaly that point to the resurrection of, of all, of all mankind. They also like, like to show themselves as family members and people 
So you'll invite them in. Yep. And you'll talk to exactly. them. Yep. And if you continue engaging in what God says don't do, then all you're doing is just keeping the door open. I don't know if I talked about this on our, on, even on our first show. Um, that's a huge part of my, my testimony, which I'll drop in as quickly as I can. That when I was at the top of like a manic fit, right? But basically the enemy appeared to me and as a wolf and said that he was God. <laughs> mm. so, so effectively, uh, and, uh, you know, even, you know, let's, let's, let's get really scary. Okay. Even spoke through my mouth. Okay. So, and why? Because you let it in. If you let it in, it's now in. You practice stuff like this tarot stuff. This, this this crap is real. I don't. That's the funny thing that people are are crazy on. Like I, I had a lot of friends who were witches. I remember one day this is back when PlayStation Two came out, and uh, she she was a witch. She had all these bead hangings in her in her door, right? And they parted like someone just threw them open and walked through, and <laughs> got super freezing cold in the room. So I mean that's what people do and so what what was it that saved my soul was that some friends got me to listen to some worship music and i read and i was like huh, what does the bible say about wolves so the first thing i turned to in the bible is jesus beware she, wolves and sheep clothing because because outwardly they are uh you know I beware false prophets for they come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly they are ravenous yeah. wolves so anyway i think so. it's interesting that you said a wolf not to mention brian godawa too much but i just finished enoch and I don't know because he does a lot of research, so I don't know if this oh, has yeah. a Mesopotamian link or a Sumerian link or what. But uh, the Cain, the curse of Cain, he was actually in it, you. You meet Cain in Enoch Primordial, hmm. and when you meet Cain, they're in this this valley, uh, this hidden valley, and he is undead essentially, and he feeds on blood to keep, stay alive essentially. And he is surrounded by what amount to werewolves, but kind of in the um, changeling sense, these yeah. black wolves. So it's just funny that you mentioned that because it's and like, before I, anybody goes crazy, oh, you you met the enemy. Okay, I just like to keep it simple, folks. <laughs> you ain't never <laughs> met the enemy. Let's just keep it simple, okay? He ain't around you. <laughs> but the other, oh, oh, he has no. See, and this is what what has the church done? We have removed demonology. There's even whole theologies out there that do not even talk about demonology. <coughs> Drunk in fact, in fact, uh. they blame. Yeah, in fact, <laughs> they, in fact, they even blame God for everything. Like basically, they're like, "But okay, so what is now? Now, what is some of your experience?" So I talked about some of those those spooky experiences. What are the, some of those experiences for you, Israel? Um. Like theologically or experiences? Like, no, no, like things that you've experienced, like back when oh, you were oh, doing something. Gotcha. How I missed that, I don't know. Um, well, there was a time period when my wife was still into witchcraft and she would randomly astral project. She didn't ask to astral project, but essentially her soul would leave her body and she would, she would not travel, but blink. She would, her eyes would close, open up, and she's somewhere else. Eyes closed, open up somewhere else. And there was, she said, hey, at the beginning of our relationship, she said, hey, um, when I am with my boyfriend or whoever I'm dating, um, I rub off on them with stuff, which scared the crap out of me. And I said, okay, well, you know, I love my wife very much. I loved her then. I knew I loved her then. Well, there was a time I had woken up in my bed and my bed was shaking. Or at least I thought it was. Pitch black room. I'm scared. I don't know why I'm scared. It's shaking. My brain goes, exorcist, exorcist. Like, I'm immediately thinking of the horror movie, exorcist. And in my mind, I'm like, something's looking at me, something's looking at me, something's looking at me. Also in my mind, I'm thinking to myself, okay, I need to wake my wife up. Well, well girlfriend at the time. But I'm like, I, I need to wake her up. And then my brain goes, you're alone. And then I felt this just cold over me. I was like, I'm alone right now. Why am I thinking my wife's next to me? Girlfriend, whatever. This is seven years ago, <laughs> but I go to take the blanket because it was, it was bunched up like a person was under it. And I was terrified. And I started getting an image of a, of like a, of a burnt corpse next to me with hair tied back here like this. And just like a fried corpse like this, like a mummy almost. And I, I threw it open and there was nothing under it, which scared me more some, for some reason. 
I jump out of bed. I didn't leave the I didn't leave the light off in my room for months. This is when back when I lived with my parents. I didn't leave a light on off in my room for months when this happened. And I ended up texting Sam, my wife. Hey, I uh, don't know if you're up. It's like two o'clock in the morning. I'm terrified. Here's what's going on. I know it's going to sound nuts. She had a dream that same night that woke her up that she was next to me. She didn't tell me this right away. She was next to me in bed. She woke up, saw me asleep. There was a thing coming out of my closet floating towards me, and she was trying to shake me awake. And she got on top of me and was shaking me to the point the bed was moving. And I woke up, and then she woke up in her dream that I didn't have. Can I tell you a story that's somewhat similar, but from Christian boy perspective? I was going to say, you guys, you guys looked a little freaked out in the beginning. <laughs> oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not freaked out. I have a couple of stories. But, yeah, you um, guys look intrigued for sure. When I was, God, I want to say 22, um, I was dating a girl. And she was raised Seventh-day Baptist, which meant she did church on Sunday and they didn't do Christmas. And I was like, a, a weird belief system. Okay. Uh, but she... Uh, she would write this poetry and one day uh, she showed me in her notebook, this poem that she'd written and it was, it kind of ended up being an acrostic, which she said she didn't do on purpose. And um, the acrostic said, demons rape me. Mm. And I was like, girl, Ooh. Uh, but yeah. We were dating. She was living about an hour and a half away from me. And one night in the middle of the night, I wake up out of nowhere. 3 a.m. 3 a.m. is a fun time. Yep. Um, I wake up and I feel impressed to pray for her. And so I wake up and I just start praying. I pray for 15 minutes and then I get a piece and I go to sleep. Um, and then... As as I did that, I was like, I don't know what that was. I didn't tell her about it. I was just, this is kind of weird. Um, and then I call her the next day, and she goes, I had the worst night last night. And I was like, what happened? And she goes, well, I, she goes, I, uh, I was having dream these horrible dreams, and in this dream, a demon was raping me. Wow. And I was like, oh, wow. And she goes, and so, and it happened all night long. And it was just a horrible dream. And uh, I said, uh, what, what time did you go to bed? When, do you remember when you started having the dream? She goes, yeah, well, I mean, I definitely went to sleep but like at 2.45, three-ish in the morning. I, I had a late night for with work, blah, blah, blah. I was like, okay. Um, and I was like, weird timing that I was asked to pray by God in the middle of the night and prayed for 15 minutes to 3.15, you know, witching hour stuff. Um, <laughs> and uh, I was like, okay, that's weird. And she goes, yeah, and it lasted all night long. And then I woke up and I was like, oh, that's really weird because I had this and I told her what happened on my end. And she was like, oh, wow. You know, I woke up uh, after, after a while and it, everything felt a lot better. And I was like, well, that's good. I guess God just wanted me to pray for you. And she, she was like, yeah, but it was all night long. And so then I, I was just like Googling things. And I was like, how long do dreams last? And I Googled how long do dreams last? At most, they typically last up to 15 minutes. Yeah, they're, well, they're not it, long at all. And it, yet, it's like all night. They can feel like they go on for a long time. I've had, I've had a dream go on for what seemed like 15, 20 minutes. And I was asleep for four straight hours. So it yeah. can kind of flip on its head a little bit, but, but it yeah, was uh, just it, insane to me that I had that. I, I felt impressed, prayed for 15 minutes, went to sleep at three o'clock in the morning at the witching hour, as it were. And then she had all of that happen and woke up feeling safe. And I was just like, what a bizarre. So, I mean, I get you, I get you in a different way, but I get you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I want to add this too. My wife doesn't have this issue anymore. And it was a couple of years ago. And mind you, it was still before we were married. So we were still, you know, we we're still Better. living in. But I will say at the same time that 
um, God continued to bless us. They were slower blessings, and it felt like we were getting cursed more than blessed a lot of the time. We were struggling hard, and now I know what that means. But um, she had this another astral projection, which is basically where the soul leaves the body. And so her, or at least her consciousness, she's gone, she's out of the body and she's blinking again. And she ends up blinking into a witch from work because she worked at a pagan shop and she turned around and she was like, what are you doing here? She was like legit mad at her. And she was like, Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to be here. <laughs> and she leaves in this and it, when she's like going around and she never had control over this. She never had control over this from start to finish. She goes back to her body, mind you. She asked for Jesus to come into her life at this point. A demon is over her body when she comes back to it. So she's not in her body yet, but she sees an entity on top of her trying to find a way to get in. She says it was struggling to do something to it. And then she rebukes it in the name of Jesus and it leaves and she wakes up. Now she woke up next to me, but she was freaking out when she did. This is what she told me. And it was the last time she ever asked her projected. Wow. And so, yeah, she's went through a lot. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, some weird, like I, I, and just a real short one. I have a friend who he, okay. So, and I, I do want, I want Zach to be able to weigh in as well, but um, I do want to talk about sleep paralysis because people try to explain away a lot of stuff by saying it's this thing that's in your brain and that's all it is. But I had a friend who had sleep paralysis and felt a demon on top of him and woke up with scratches on his back that he couldn't reach with his own hands. Hmm. And so I'd like to talk about that. I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. But Zach, you had something to say. Okay. So one thing I'm going to say right now, and it's going to be upsetting to a lot of people is you see people joking around about sleep paralysis demons. If you're afflicted by something like that, the Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Yep. So I'm just going to, I'm going to tell you right now that demonic possession, this is something that, that both Israel and I have against these so-called deliverance ministers, right? Mm -hmm. Who try to gatekeep deliverance and try to um, say, oh, well, my ministry is special. You need to get delivered by me. Yeah, I believe in deliverance. I believe in affliction. I believe in, you know, the laying on of hands and blah, blah, blah. But the thing is, blah, blah, blah. That was great. But the thing is, uh, full bore, uh, I agree with my brother, the Hallelujah Hulk on this one. True like there's a there's certain in, uh, Christian influencers who roll around on the floor and fake being delivered over and over again. I don't know which, these people. <laughs> which is a making a mockery of the Holy Ghost, first of all. Yep. And the issue I have is that um, the presence of demonic possession is sign of a lack of a genuine conversion. Yes. Yep. So I'm just going to tell you right now that if you're experiencing sleep paralysis demons, I think you really need to call on the Lord Jesus and be saved. Yep. And I always love saying stuff like that because it really pisses off a lot of people who think that they're Christians. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know what? There it is right there. Yeah. Especially who? Well, I was going to say, especially Christians who affirm uh, once they've always stayed and hold on to it real tight. Yeah. They think I've been regenerated. That's it. I'm done. And it's like, well, you got backslidden Christians that leave the door wide open to their home. Yeah. And uh, then things happen again. And, and it's like, You'll, you're known by your fruits, and if you're constantly getting attacked by demons, I mean, you're not bearing that fruit, but it shows a lack of fruit for sure. Mm. <laughs> like the Bible, I, I hate to say it, but the Bible says, tree. yeah, the Bible says, pursue peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Right, but make I your theology say, work against that verse. <laughs> exactly, and I, I will add this as well, and I found this to be really interesting. And, um, Sleep paralysis really does require some level of discernment as well, because you see in the book of Job where his his hair on his skin is standing straight up mm. and it's angels mm. that are actually over him and he can't move and he and he feels scared. Doesn't know why, but he feels scared and he can't move. It says that he could hear them, but he couldn't turn his head. He couldn't do nothing. He was just stuck. So. Another reason that I could see why someone would say, see right there, angel, you know, fallen angels are demons because they cause this the same thing. But I will also add to that and say fallen angels have the ability to go to and fro like the like the Satan did in Job. Or as Heiser says, a Satan, but I don't want to get into that. Um, <laughs> but um, the idea that. Well, what I believe is that if the demon is a disembodied Nephilim. 
and it's stuck on the earth. That's what it means. It is stuck. It can't, it can't leave our plane of existence. But then you look at a fallen angel that lines more up with an alien because an alien is able to zip into the sky or come back down to the earth. But once again, demons can't do that. What do demons also do? They mimic dead people. Well, what do fallen angels do? They, they, they mimic being a good angel because yeah. they still have the light in them. Or a the God. Demon, right. And, or, or a God. And then you have a demon that is the perverted image of, of God himself, of, it, of his face, right? Because we're God's imagers. You got demons that are the disembodiment of, a per, of the perversion of God's face. So what can they mimic? Well, they can't mimic something with light because they never had light. But they can mimic a dead person because they came from people. Mm. Not just people, but you could say they had the worst of both qualities. Yeah. For sure. I mean, you can see it in their actions. I mean, they're what? They, they're drinking blood? <laughs> I mean. Yeah. Well, and it's like uh, when it comes to the principalities and the powers, it's like there's a whole conversation to be had about what is happening right now. What is, mm -hmm. what is still around? I mean, Paul clearly spoke about the principalities and the powers in the present tense, but it like you see some of the, and it's not just conspiracies. It's like legitimate things you can look at, like not made up conspiracies. There are all kinds of conspiracies, um, sure. like real life conspiracies, but um, you see some of the things that these elites do. Like the, with the Marina and Bramovich in particular, I don't know if you know who she is with the spirit cooking, with these the the ties to, um, well, child sacrifice at large in mass, and then also um, child sexual abuse that you've you. It's not a Epstein had an island. It's not a he had a log book. It's not like a conspiracy to go. Oh well. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Bill Clinton went there nine times. You think he just yeah. played pool the whole time? No, he did some stuff. He did some shady stuff. I'm not going to say exactly what it was, but he did some shady stuff. You don't go there that many times. That just can't. All I'm saying, <laughs> all I'm saying is that there is most certainly a connection between the principalities and the powers, the um, princes of the Prince of America or um, the Americas, the 50 different princes, if there are that many, there's some horrible ones out there doing some horrible stuff. And I just want to burn them all to the ground. That's all I want to say. <laughs> so one thing I'll bring up in that before, um, you know, the other day I refuted that Freemason. Yeah. And in order to refute him, I quoted Albert Pike, who is not just a notorious Freemason. He's also a notorious Luciferian. Yep. That's very clear from all of his writings. And so I just want you to know that my mother's whole, I like to joke that someone's whole gospel is one thing or another. My mother's whole gospel is life and death is in the tongue. Don't speak it over yourself. Not of a name it and claim it, but you know what I mean? Don't speak it over yourself, which I, I believe, you know, we have, we, we've been given the power to release things. It's not, that's not authority, you know, Joel Osteen to speak a, a Mercedes Benz into your, in your driveway. That'd be freaking nice though, man. But I mean, yeah, but don't do it. But <laughs> so you don't know what you yeah, don't know don't what do handing that to you if it were to happen and you just bingo yeah. bingo see what whatever we we going to plead the blood of Jesus a little bit right but the thing is is that uh, when it comes to uh, you know in order to make that refutation I had to read that man's words and let me tell you that I came under attack I had to go into prayer because yeah. what did I do I read the words of a Luciferian giving Luciferian doctrine out loud. Uh, again, the Freemasons, tons of conspiracy theories. Listen, I don't care about the conspiracy theories. What I'm here to tell you right now is that I don't need any of them. I right. don't I don't endorse the Freemasons. I don't believe that there's any such thing as a Freemason Christian. I'm sorry, I'm sorry if that upsets you. You I, I encourage everybody to leave the Freemasons and make a video of them throwing their ring in the trash. I'm sorry. That's that's that. I, I have a hard line against them. And the, because the reality is, can you trace this to, to historical Christian practice? No. Can you trace this to uh, historical Protestant Christian practice? When I say historical practice, I always mean like the ancient church. No. Yeah. So, yeah. so if you're if you're tracing this to the straight up enlightenment, like the narrative that a lot of people get told 
um, there used to be this game called Knight's Quest or whatever, and it tried to paint the Templars as these great dudes. But in all reality, they were <laughs> they were freaking heretics. <laughs> and they had a ton of power. And, you know, I remember one of my friends who is a Cambridge professor, and he did a little bit of study in it because, you know, the, 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 the narrative we get taught is that they were great dudes. And, you know, they were unjustly, in short, you know, I'm not a fan of, like, burning people to death. But, but just to say, again... That that power, you, you spoke those words just like when you were talking about you speak into the dead. Probably no bueno. Yeah, yeah. don't do that. <laughs> yeah, don't just don't do it. <laughs> and um, and, the, and these are the words of Heiser. Although I believe this for a long time, it is uh, God doesn't instruct you not to do something unless you could do it. Yeah, which you see a lot of in Deuteronomy. Um, so. That just, go, just another reason that I believe that there is that difference. But um, yeah, Freemasonry. I, I do have something else to tell you guys, actually. I got a good friend of mine. I'm not going to say him his name, um, but we are good friends. He's actually one of the few friends I do have. <laughs> Me be officially being 30 years old, I don't have many of those anymore. I'm but, telling you, dude. I'm telling you. You got to make them online. So I'll be your friend. Well, funnily enough, you actually remind me if, my uh because he's a good friend of mine too but i never get to see him his name's dakota and if you took dakota and zach galifianakis and put him into the same person as you i'm not kidding and they I both have big beards like it's, it's just there, so. i've heard the that. zach galifianakis thing many times it's, yeah, it's I, your I, mannerisms too i prefer chubby obi-wan kenobi but that's fine that's fine <laughs> well so i got a friend of mine he's a, he's a first degree mason he has been for a long time and uh, he's never went above one. To me, that says something. Um, he, so he's, he stayed at first degree. He considers it a brotherhood. And I've told them, hey, you know, I'd be careful with that. You're try, trying to lay him down gently, right? Because he gets a lot of people to come up to him and say, you need to repent and get out of it. You need to get out of it and repent, all this. And now he, he makes a mockery of that. And so it's like, I can't, I can't approach him like that. But he gave me a story, and I told him he needs to think about what happened to him. There was a guy, he was wearing his Freemason hat, and there was a guy who came up to him and said, you don't deserve that hat. And he said, what do you mean? He said, you don't deserve that hat. He said, he, he, he was telling me, he's like, we're, we're, we're brothers, right? And then he said, no, 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 you're, you're not a Mason. You're not a Mason. And he takes the hat and throws it. <laughs> And the guy was so angry. And I told him, I said, you thought maybe you made him manifest by your mere existence. And I didn't say this in front of him, but maybe perhaps by him serving two masters and struggling under this situation of Freemasonry and him. I mean, he, he, was, he was with me when I uh, baptized um, Peter. And I love him to death. But this experience, all I could think was two masters, two masters, two masters. He, because of this, he pissed off the demon in another mason, and the mason said, you don't deserve this hat, snatched it off his head and threw it to the woods. And no one would help him get it. He was like, why is no one helping me? I thought we were like, we're, we're the same organization. It's like, no, you're not. <laughs> look, look at the bushes. Look at the bushes. They're not just part of one secret organization. They're also skull and bones. Yeah. So how can you be part of two secret organizations? Isn't that basically a conflict of interest? And the answer is, yes, it is. Mm -hmm. So unless those two are the same organization, unless, <laughs> you know, they challenged George Washington. They said, because the Bavarian Illuminati was such a conspiracy theory in his day. And they asked him to denounce Freemasonry. And he got up and, uh, and, and George Washington himself got up and said, I have not, and have never been a member of the Illuminati. So he wow. did not, he refused to denounce Freemasonry. One of the things that we forget with this, and again, we'll get back on, whatever <laughs> is that is that Albert Pike in his writings makes very clear that he believes that there are though that this is a sanctifying act. Yeah. They believe it's sanctifying. And the thing is those of us who are of the Holy ghost through Jesus Christ, our Lord, praise the Lord. We understand that sanctification is the kind of difficult things that are a reflection of the spiritual realm that we go through. Right, and we also have you know fasting, conf confession, prayer, and and uh, and the Lord's Supper. Right. Yeah. We confess mm -hmm. our sins to one another. This is not you know, and that's the thing is that you you can't have more than one sanctification. Right. 
There can only be sanctification through Jesus Christ. There can only be sanctification through. And in fact, Israel and I just had a very interesting conversation before this started. And we were talking about how the, you know, a lot of atheists and like Marxists and like big picture, you know, they try to say, oh, well, we're going to, we're, we're going to, you know, they, they lose sight of the sanctity of human life, don't they? Because yep. they're like, we're going to break, we're going to break a few eggs in order to make omelets. Well, that analogy doesn't hold up because you're throwing those eggs away. If you throw the eggs away, you have no omelet to make. So <laughs> it's not the case that you're, you know, breaking eggs to make omelets. And what the Lord gave me when we were really talking about that was that the moment you take God out of the picture, what is sanctity? Sanctity is sacredness. So how could you ever make an argument for sacredness without God? The answer is really that you can't. Not without, not without like a lot of circular logic that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. But anyway, well, and a lot of that I think has to do with um, there's a lot of faux sanctification. There's a lot mm -hmm. of faux, there's a lot of fake holiness. There's a lot of fake separation. You know what I mean? Like the, it, there's yeah. all sorts of stuff that that purport themselves to be the truth. It's got to be just a little, just close enough. Like look at the most famously uh, successful cults of all time. Islam. Uh, what's the uh, Mormonism? Freemasonry. All of these take and pervert the truth of Jesus Christ in order to, to spread themselves and to poison the well for actual Christianity. I mean, yeah. look, at, look at how Mormonism works, which Mormon friends, I love you, but please get away from that. Um, but Look, I, I've had friends who were uh, we. I interviewed, or not interview. It's not really interviews; it's just conversations. But I talked to a guy named Ben um, Brown, who is the nephew of Cody Brown of uh, Sister Wives fame, so Mormon polygamist cult. Uh, he got out of that, and he didn't leave Mormonism and become a Christian. He didn't find Jesus because Jesus had been ruined for him. By Joseph Smith, just like Jesus is ruined for most Muslims who don't have that that dream that God sends them, which is such a fascinating thing. I, I don't know if y'all know about that. How I know many, a little bit. So many I've met I, personally. I've talked to five or six Muslims who were straight up happy Muslims, happy uh, Muslims until Isa came to them in a dream and said to repent and to follow Jesus, follow him. Yep, I've I've spoken with Muslims too. That you know, isn't that funny? You know, Charles Spurgeon. He once said he was talking about a commentary in Genesis one. He's like, "How did God make light before He made the sun?" He said, "The answer is that God is so powerful that He can do whatever He wants. He can spread the gospel by His own means if He wants. He doesn't even need us." Yeah, and so I mean, that's that's the fruit of it right there. I've seen a bunch of people who have that testimony that they were they were Muslims and they were not even seeking Jesus, and Jesus appeared to them in a vision, and now they're by they're they're Bible Christians. But that's that's why things like Mormonism are the most dangerous cults is because uh, that's why I'd be really excited to talk to um, Naomi Wright, who we were supposed to talk to last week, but she got sick. So we're going to do that in January. Um, but she her her dad started a Christian polygamist cult that she got out of. But mm. by the grace of God, she is still held fast to Jesus. Mm. The truth. Now, this, this conversation is awesome because it reminds me of Israel's analogy of the abusive parent, of viewing God as the abusive parent. Yeah. So, Israel, I would love you to kick that because it's such a neat analogy. Okay. So, um, this ironically, now we won't talk about that, but maybe we will. Maybe, maybe we will. We Just do it. Just do it. Let me, let me get into a backstory. Uh, well, because... This, it's deep, it's personal. There are drawings of Jesus up that make him look very white. You mean like, like this one? <laughs> and <laughs> there's some where he has longer hair, it's about down here, and he's got the beard, and he's got the darker hair. I mean, he, he doesn't look like how you would imagine Jesus, to be honest. But these paintings reminded me very much of my father when I was younger. And he was a bit angry when I was younger. I had to break through that 
which took me a long time. And so eventually over time, after getting through that and forming my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, realizing, okay, this is the father's face. I'm finding him. Um, and the more I did that, the less I became like how my dad was when he was in his thirties. And I do still have my moments where I'm manic because I'm bouncing. My, my symptoms range between, these are not my words, the psychiatrist. My symptoms range between BPD and bipolar. I'm somewhere in the middle. Okay. Now, BPD is an upbringing thing. That's more, that's a lot less uh, nature and more nurture, right. unfortunately. Unfortunately, which is why I could have inherited one thing and also kind of, you know, grew up in another. And they kind of mashed together. So it made me think about, well, you see me, you've seen the father. And I'm like, why am I seeing my dad in these paintings? Yeah. Can, have you ever, I know this is going to sound like a weird question to throw in there. But all truth is God's truth. And uh, have you ever watched the movie Fight Club? Love it. My favorite movie. In Fight Club. He was about to make a huge apologetic video about Fight Club. <laughs> <laughs> in Fight Club, there is one statement. I can't remember the exact quote. But he talks about how um, essentially says that the way people view God is how they view their fathers. In Fight Club. I forget. The exact quote. Okay, it's when he initiates him. He burns his hand with chemical burn, and he says, um, "With with the way we're raised, what is it? And, and the way we break away from our parents out of rebellion, what does it say about God and us being His children?" Right. And then basically paints God as being no better than the parents that raised us. Therefore, we need to get away from from our parents and from God. Right. And so in that, in why I believe Tyler Durden's a demon. But <laughs> <laughs> there we go. In, in in that movie, it it enlightened me to a truth, which is that we often base our view of God off of our fathers. So if our father is particularly abusive, so is God. If our God is if our God, if our father is particularly absent, so is God. If our father doesn't speak to us, neither does God. And so there is a a portion of becoming a Christian in that sanctification process, that 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 growing in Christ where you have to uh god doesn't change but you have to change the face of god in your your mind and so it's it's just funny yeah. that, you that in your favorite movies fight club that's that's just hilarious to me <laughs> yeah and no coincidences so that's a nice little thing for us to all think about it when we go to sleep tonight but yeah i mean it's it's one of those things where uh it, and this goes back to the tweet and my video where you know jesus said you see me you seeing the father so why is it that people who grew up in a christian household when they see God, they don't, or when they see Jesus, they don't see the father, but rather their abusive parent. It's this rhythm over and over again. I mean, they treat Jesus like he is whatever their abuser was or whatever their toxic whoever was. And um, it's just this, you know, constant cycle. It's one of the reasons why I am very adamant about not making an echo chain. I have a lot of non-believers that follow me and I continue to, you know, some people will say, Hey, you know what? Um, I like all your stuff. I'm not a Christian, but I like all your stuff. And it's like, I want you to stick around more than anybody because I'm, I'm leading you to Christ. Dude, let me tell you, I, I, I've had people like, I'm not even doing, this was before I was going full on into Christian stuff, but I have had, Four people come to me and say, hey, I have either renewed my uh, relationship with Jesus or whatever the word. What's the word people use? Uh, it's not renewed. Rededicated. Rededicated their lives. Um, or people who have said, I have decided to follow Jesus. I had an atheist friend of mine who has been following me tell me recently he decided that he was going to follow Jesus and wanted my help understanding different things. And I'm like, I do share the gospel. But I don't do it like a street preacher. I just talk about the Bible and I talk about Jesus and I end up talking about resurrection no matter what. <laughs> and it's isn't that fascinating though, how God can use us and our gifts despite ourselves. Yep. That's pretty cool. You could be having a row with God. You could be pissed off at God. You could be like, there's no way. I am not going, man, Lord, I really need for you to do X, Y, and Z in my life. And you know what? I'm going to be white knuckled and super angry with you right now. And you know what he's going to do? He's going to put somebody in front of you that you need to tell about Jesus. And you're going to tell him about Jesus like it's the greatest thing in the world. 
because he is yeah. the greatest thing in the world. He's, he's going to enough. overpower your anger, <laughs> and he's going to remind you of his goodness by putting someone in front of you that you're going to have to be like, you know what? I'm sorry, Lord, you were right all along. Yeah, Imagine and you won't that. realize it until after the fact. You'll be mad at God <laughs> on day one. You introduce the gospel on day three because you're in a completely different mood. You don't forgot the vendetta you had against him. Mm -hmm. But you know that person needs Christ, which is why you you profess with your mouth why they need Christ. Mm. And then you kind of end up preaching to yourself too. Yeah, that's like it it's so funny because like I was talking to um, my wife not that long ago and she was like, God doesn't talk to me the same way that he speaks to you. And I'm like, well, there is this kind of uh, sometimes I get this inaudible but unmistakable voice of God. Like it's not like I just I, I feel I get the words. I feel the words. I know what he's saying. And then there yeah. are other times I am preaching what God wants me to preach, but I think I'm preaching it to someone else. And he is just eating my lunch because I'm like, oh, wow, I'm the hypocrite. It's so constant. And that's how God talks to me the most is by me saying the right things, but my spirit not kept, my spirit knowing, but my my body, my my soul. I mean, we're we're not too we're not dualistic, but you know what I mean? Like my my yeah. flesh that, that Paul talks about not catching up yet. You know, I want I want to talk about the two natures in the person, like the dualistic idea. Um, there was a guru, and I don't know if like traditional Hindus believe this, but there was a there was a guru that was talking about how the darkness in someone is not, it's destructive, but it's not necessarily evil. Now, these are not my words. The darkness in someone basically completes the light, the light that's in them. And then it kind of makes this balance and he compares it to like a volcano erupting on earth or a tidal wave coming in from the ocean. Okay. So when I hear a Calvinist talk, I hear them kind of talking like a Hindu. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. I'm like, you're, you're no better than, like, I probably would get along better with Hindus because at least they know what God they serve. <laughs> and like, the Calvinist will sit there and say such horrible things, and I'm like, you have dug yourself a hole. The words that you profess out of your mouth, man, you are going to have to, first of all, you're going to eat those words, but secondly, you're going to have to ask forgiveness. There's going to be a time when God says, what did you say about me? <laughs> <laughs> I shared with you a uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson quote. Was that on the show or was that afterwards? I, I don't remember. I think it was after, actually. Yeah, man. Let me tell you, John, Thomas and Thomas Jefferson totally agrees with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, look at you know, uh, you way back when I studied Oppenheimer because it was fun, and Oppenheimer was a big fan of the Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita was, which is of course a Hindu holy book. So I read it just because I wanted to be like, oh, that's weird. Because you notice that when people get it in power, they get that Babylonian sensibility. So they start building a Rome around themselves, right? What's, what was yep. that? Rome didn't worship any of their gods. Rome is named after a man. So they all worship themselves, and they claim that the, the gods bless Rome. Yeah. So so the thing is that you when you see that, you see these people reading, you know, even, even something as supposedly uh, banal as like uh, the art of war. Sun Tzu is the art of war. So they start running away to these other ideas. You're right, and Oppenheimer was a big fan of that. That's where he got his idea of trade. What come death, destroyer yep. of worlds. That's right. That's what he said. He it's what he supposedly said. He actually said a different quote when it went off, and I don't remember what that was. <laughs> He's, uh, but the thing is, here he was a Jewish man, quoting out the Bhagavad Gita, creating his own little Roman religion. You know what I mean? This own little self-glorifying kind of an idea. And what's in Hinduism is Ram, uh, uh, ta, uh, just like you were talking about, uh, Rajas Tamas Sattva. So they they believe that good and evil is like water that goes from water to ice to gas and back again. Yeah, they they don't believe in a solid. But the Bible obviously. So therefore, obviously, it's inescapable. Obviously, karma is inescapable because it's just move and moving force. But that's the good news of the gospel is that Jesus has actually risen above the karma system. And I think the one of the things that all of us focus on, and I know that you focus on it too, is that that's this forgotten dimension of the gospel that Jesus is the is triumphant over the principalities and powers. Yep. So what's your what's your take on that? What's your take on that piece of the you know, the Bible Paul says in uh, Colossians, he says, for he has disarmed, which is of course a euphemism for defeating the principalities and powers. Asking me or yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yes, you Israel. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because oh. <laughs> because you, like, like not talking. <laughs> yeah. No, I'd love to hear your perspective on. It. Sorry, I keep pressing my mute button. Is what it is. Um, I don't know. I believe that uh, he's disarmed them. Yeah. Every principality around the world has been disarmed. We we can go, you know, with God's permission, we can go anywhere we want and present the gospel. Or in the case of this country, reintroduce the gospel, which is something I think we need. Because, and that's why I have I'm so adamant about teaching is because you know the elementary fundamentals, or in some cases, it's been warped, like in a lot of Baptist homes, it's been well, warped in some sense or complacent, or it's not quite. It's like it's so watered down; it's not even funny, and it feels like I need to reintroduce it because if I teach this and then bring it back to, and that's why you believe this since you were five years old, you say, Oh, I never looked at it that way. That's mm. like my favorite thing to hear. And so yes. that's what I'm in. I'm, I'm essentially, I guess you could say I I'm aiding in the process of um, maybe, I mean, I'm nothing compared to God here, but when I see what kind of spell this country is under, which is something that kind of flashed in my brain with spell, bewitched, is this concept of Jesus Christ being hidden in plain sight. And that's why he's just not as powerful as he's supposed to be. And that angers me to mm. my core. And I think that's why I see it as complacent, these evangelical, some in, in some cases cults, but the, the evangelical community as a whole, whether they're extreme about it or not, I'm not for it. I'm completely against it. We need to be preaching in the streets, not in the pews. We have way too many churches. And if we discipled more than we gained church members, we wouldn't need so many freaking buildings. Well, that's the problem is I think that if you really uh, – Scott McKnight wrote a book called The King Jesus Gospel, and it was a pretty good book. But one of the points that he made was that regardless of the church you're looking at, Orthodox, Catholic, they all have different versions of the same issue, which is the issue of discipleship, the issue of lack of discipleship. They don't know. They know how to make converts. They know how to they, they're soteriologists, soteri, soterians is what he said. They know how to tell people how to be saved, but they don't know how to disciple them after. Yeah, I think that's it's true. A black feeling is what it is. And then when you create a. And, you know, Paul talks about these milk drinkers and says, you can't eat, you don't need uh, meat, you, you need milk. Uh, you can't have solid food. Um, that's Hebrews 5, I think. And so you, you think about that and you think about you got 60 year old evangelicals that are still milk drinkers. And that's terrifying because this is why God has handed the mantle down to the younger generation, which um, I mean, I. I, I think that it's somewhere between you you guys' generation. I, are you guys closer to the same age or is I'm, anyone closer to I'm my 30, age? I'm 34. 34, 38? I'm, I'm, I'm about to be 40 next month. So Not that I meant to call you out like that. I'm sorry. But um, in fact, hey, look, man, I got a cousin that is 42 <laughs> and he acts younger than you. Actually, he <laughs> – sorry, Eddie Joe, if you're watching this. I'm sorry. Like – you, you, you're uh, you're awesome. Whatever. Man. Grow you up. Are. Grow However, up. You, <laughs> Grow he's working up. on it. God is working on him for sure. You know that God was working on him so much that he actually showed <laughs> one of your videos to me and he didn't even know it. Who? Mine? Your, your video about uh, pastors only being oh, yeah, it blew doctors. Up. It blew up. He, it's... he sent it to me and said, I was convicted over this. I yeah. said, I disciple under Here's him. God. And he goes, that's him? <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the, the point I was making, see, now everybody's like, oh, you're talking about yourself, and now you start the conversation with pastors. It's not about me. Um, I can only speak from my experience. I live in a county with 163 churches, and never, ever has a pastor started a conversation about faith with me. Yeah. I've started the conversation about faith. Because I, I, I have that kind of an annoyance. But you know what they, you know they will talk to you about, though? They'll talk about what's going on in their church. They'll also start and talking about politics. Because yep. I think mm. one of the things that if you haven't noticed this yet, Israel, is the primary religion of America is the American civil religion. And yep. it, has the veneer of, it has the veneer of Christianity. It uses mm. Christianity. 
and it's on both sides. It's on the mm-hmm. conservative side and the progressive side, just in different flavors. Like the if you look at progressives, their um, philosophical theological worldview stems from the Puritans. It stems from um, the social gospel that uh, what's his name, uh, worst president that there ever was, Wilson, was a big proponent of. And so, and then you see on the on the the conservative side, you look at Dallas uh, Baptist Church or whatever it is, it's singing essentially praise and worship songs to Donald Trump. Mm. The endemic problem in America when it comes to Christianity is civil religion, which is why mm. it's so important to look at Revelation and see what Jesus was calling out those seven churches for, mm. which was civil religion. That is the biggest issue, I think, in our day. And, and by preaching the gospel, the true gospel, and not preaching politics, not preaching America. That's yeah, what Jesus, Jesus should not be pointing you to the Republican Party. <laughs> if right. anything, what, if, if politics are correct, whatever side you're on, if, if, if there's any good in that, whatever side you're on, it should be pointing you to Christ. Mm-hmm. It should always be pointing you up. It shouldn't be pointing you across to your neighbor and going, oh, you have more truth than I do. I'm going to believe what you believe. It's like we're, we're screwed if we do that. We believe mm-hmm. in relativism, for God's sakes. We don't need to do that. Right, and that's, that's one of the big problems, and that's why my show shifted. That's why a lot of – I was outside of that realm in, in, in a lot of ways. I was at a, in a different quadrant than most people, but <laughs> – I came to realize that I was not putting kingdom first and I was pretending like if you're proud to be American, sure. I'm proud to be Alabamian. I was born and raised in Alabama, roll tide. But when that becomes your center and when people question, like they have me, my Christianity for not being a huge fan of flags in the sanctuary, then you see that there's an issue. You know what I mean? Like there's there's a problem here. And I think that we need to figure out how to convince people that right. they are ambassadors of a different nation. And we are living in this 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 nation, this foreign nation, and we, we want to do good while we're here. We want to do good by the people and the land and everything. But we're ambassadors. It's not yes. our home. Not, not, not until God renews it. Does that make sense, Coop? Oh, yeah. We're we're kingdom citizens living in a present reality. Yeah. Romans 13 is not about obeying the damn government, you freak. <laughs> I saw that coming. <laughs> you disgusting, freak, heretic, lying sacks of crap. Every politician that has ever wielded Romans 13 is going to burn in hell. <laughs> They're going to be casted into Babylon the lake of fire. Will be. Burn. Alas, Babylon. There is a reason. I was just thinking about this. Oh, I was just thinking about this at the gym. If you've ever read the book, uh, it was like a high school reading book, Alas, Babylon. And it's all about like the nuclear, holo- a speculative fiction about the nuclear holocaust. And now everybody is trying to survive in America. And this dude, the, they used to, the code was Alas, Babylon because they would always go to this black church and the preacher would would talk about America and talk and read from Revelation, talk about how filthy America is and, and cry out, alas, Babylon. So, I mean, yeah, you know, I don't let let each person be re- led by their convictions. I if, if a church wants to put a flag in the sanctuary, that's fine. You know what? Let be led by your convictions. But at the end of the day, we need to remember that America is not that's not the eternal. It's not the eternal kingdom. Right. God, is, God is not pleased by what we have done as a nation. And in, I'm actually, I'm, I'm right in between you, both of you when it comes to flags in the sanctuary. In fact, I explained this to you because mm. I started going way too libertarian with that thought process. And that starts getting demonic real fast, a lot faster than I anticipated. But you dig in the history of that, holy crap. But mm. um, yeah, and I lean towards you as well, um, because Cam, because people really lose sight of Christ fast. When that flag goes up there, I'm worried there's a bunch of Trump worshipers when I walk into the sanctuary. That's uh, the thing I'm scared of. So I love, yeah, I love America. I served our, 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 our country for 12 years, 12 years in the Marine Corps, right? Counterintelligence. I got my hands dirty in the name of our country. I love our country. Would I do it all over again? Yeah, I guess. But the big thing, the big thing is we've got to recognize, we, just like you said, we've got to have that discernment. 
Yes. American exceptionalism. I love, I love my country. American exceptionalism is a false gospel. Oh, period. Yeah. Yes. Period. Yeah. Yes. We got we yes, we've been blessed. We have grace of God. We should be thankful for those people. That that's how I view patriotism. I'm thankful that I grew up in this country where I have freedom to believe as as I as I feel led, right? I have yeah. freedom in theory to to say what I want to say. So that's that's the grace and blessing of God. But in terms of like, you know, the but the moment we start to to, you know, go down that that rabbit hole of thinking, you know, and I've heard many preachers say, uh, God is going to take back America. God is going to is going to save America. God is going to kick Satan out of America. OK, not if they keep putting a ring on Satan's finger. Yep. Well, you said you said the thing about Romans 13, but let's look at the other verse that people use to justify it, which is the uh, render unto Caesar. And that's the wrong. Mm. Let's talk. Let's talk about that just briefly, um, okay. because one of the realizations I came to it came to, I wrote a piece about it. I need to find that. Um, but if you look at what Jesus is saying, he he has flipped it on them so heartily, oh, yeah. so quickly that it doesn't. The, the what he's saying is not what they expect because they would want to kill him if they if he backed Rome. Mm. And they would want to, and they would want Rome to kill him if he backed the Jew, Jewish idea of revolt at that time in, in history. And Jesus goes, this is a concession. Pay your taxes. Don't get yourself killed. We have a bigger mission at hand. Among I, I, other things. It, it's multifaceted. I want to, yeah, it's a, now I want to hear Israel's take on that. What's your take on, what's your take on render to Caesar what Caesar's render to God what's God's? Well, um, so render to Caesar what is Caesar's, uh, his face is on the coin, render to God what is God's, that's you. That is, you're, that, that, you're, that is, you're on his coin. <laughs> that is, that is my take. You are the image bearer. Now, see, I yep. like N.T. Wright's take on this even better. And I don't know if you've heard of it or not or before. I, I like it a lot because basically, basically another way that Jesus is stringing them up is number one, he's basically quoting Maccabees, whether we realize this or not, right? Because in Maccabees, Josephus Maccabeus tells the Syrians, to the Syrians, we'll pay our debts, but to God, we'll pay the law. So in other words, he's saying, my, my loyalty my loyalty actually belongs to God. And this would have been fresh in the mind of, and uh, from N.T. Wright's perspective, that would have been fresh in the mind of Jewish people at the time. So yeah. is Jesus quoting Maccabees? We don't, we, I, you know, whatever. But the big thing is this. What Jesus is saying is, Caesar don't own shit. <laughs> like I said, multi <laughs> That's what, that's what Jesus is really saying here. He said, "You render to Caesar what Caesar's, render to God what's God's." Who who does Caesar belong to? The earth is the Lord's in the fullness thereof. <laughs> that's, yeah. So that's ultimately he completely did. Just if they try to challenge him on that, then they're challenging God's ownership of all things. Very true. Yes. So it, it, it was a re a rhetorical grenade. Is it was, <laughs> it, yeah. it, it, like, did, like I said, it's multifaceted, and he Jesus he, what, like for real. We have a mission. Be because he's the Lord and because he's such a the, the original OG, right? Jesus was just the master at asking the better question. You know, they they went into he went in to flip the tables. He said, By what authority do you do this? And he said, Well, let me ask you this question. By what authority was John's baptism? Was it from man or was it from God? But they knowing that that people considered John a prophet, they didn't want to answer. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. I'm just saying I do not I do not politic anymore. But that's truly just because I, I'm focused on the kingdom. I'm focused mm. on my mission, and anything else is tangential, and I don't, I don't care. <laughs> don't care about the rest of it. But it's nice. It's nice. We, oh, we'll talk about that offline. Oh um, well, yeah, 2020 actually consumed me with uh, politics. So I wasn't in it for very long, but I got out of it when it was intense. And God, that, right then, that's when God started pulling me into the. Um, into the sanctification process, which, by the way, the harder you push back in the sanctification process, the harder it's going to push back on you. And it, I mean, the devil wanted to kill me in that sanctification process. The pressure that was put, I was put under, it, it would, it could have, I won't say would, like definitely, but it could have killed others. It could have killed me, honestly. I persevered because I saw some, I saw some light at the end of the tunnel. And for, sure enough, I got it. 
what a fun conversation this has been. It's gone <laughs> everywhere. And I love those, uh, you know, like some people may not like that it goes everywhere, but I don't care. I, we got to talk about just about anything that came to mind. Is there anything else that we missed that you can think of, Zach? Uh, yeah. Okay. So Israel, let's go here. What's, what's like your current up, you know, we, we obviously, you know, we want to protect our own copyrights. So to, I'm just joking around, but what's your like next big project that you're, you know, what, what is the theme of the kind of next big project that you're working on without really going too far into it? Trying to get my merch line going, man. <laughs> you want I, have, I have nine designs, nine designs. And I feel like I'm under analysis paralysis. I'm actually, I can show this one. Let me turn you guys around. Okay. Sweet. I'll show you my newest design in a minute too. Can you guys read that? Uh-uh. Oh, I can barely see it. Let's see. Yeah, I love the new sunroom, by the way. Thank you. I'm gonna let's see if I make it full screen if we can see that. Yeah, if if we could full screen if, if there's a way to full screen that because unfortunately I can't really blow it up any bigger. Oh wow. Okay. Well okay. I mean just um, the boom. And then boom. Oops. Let's see. Yeah, it's blurry. Is What's... it? I can tell you what it says. Yeah. yeah, sure. So I make mock-ups. What it says is, if aliens are demons, I have just one question, dot, 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 do they bleed? And at the bottom, it says, doom is the kick thing. Because I love doom. But that's one of my uh, shirts I'm coming out with. Right on. Do you right want to see my, my, the shirts I've recently come out with? Yeah, right on. Uh, Good. Well, I'll, I'll start. With, let me start with this because I, I, I wanted to create like a personal logo. And so that's what I was working on last night. And so I'll show you that, what I'm working on for that. Oh, I don't know if you'll be able to see it because the, let uh, me get, maybe the white will look good. Yeah, that'll be fine. Um, here, sorry. Just yapping. No, as I, okay, so share. So this is the personal logo that I'm working on right now, which is a jackalope because it's like my favorite thing. Nice. <laughs> um, that's Sorry. one thing. <laughs> which I also have one on my on my arm. I don't know if you saw that. If you if you blend wow. it a little bit, it almost looks like the Impala logo. Huh. Maybe you could blend it into the Impala. You would have like a high speed jackalope. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that would be kind of cool, actually. And this is so my, me and my friend Brad do some stuff together. And this is the, which I, I guess I could just scroll my, let's do that. That'll be better. Scroll my, my Etsy. Let's see. We are the madwoman's.com slash door. <clears throat> um, we have the, the black tank club is what we, what I named it. This shirt is so oh, funny. I like. I actually liked. <laughs> I, had, I had fun doing that one, um, and then, cool. of course, our my my Christmas designs are now out again. So you got like you know your ornament mug and stuff like that. I got, of course, that's I'm a little, cool coffee cup, man. Oh man, I've got. Well, let's see. Where's my? They also have the little camping ones as well, which are pretty cool. Um, but this is the 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 black tank. What I call the big black mug. Because I'm a dirty human being with a dirty mind. <laughs> you can't, you can't, you can't tell me that this isn't some handsome stuff, man. I'm just. That's I'm a just, cool mug too. Actually, this is, yeah. this is one of my favorites, though. Is I the P and the Chiro Chiro the, Alpha Omega favorite symbol of mine. Yeah, which I think I'm gonna put that on a mug soon. So if you want one, I'll have a mm, mug. Mm. Um, but no, Don't I give love it to it. me for free. I'm, I want to support the shop. Hey, I, but anyway, I just saying. That. Uh, yeah, <laughs> just I'll, 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 I'll put one of those out today. If you need any help with designs, I can help. Right on. So just let me know. Uh, if you if you want help with, I, I mean, I, I'm not like a, I don't draw. That's not my gift. But I compile like a, like a. I'm not going to say a bad word, but insert a bad word. I compile like a blank. Um, <laughs> so just let me know. I can help. Like a like, motor scooter. There you go. Like a mother father. Hey, there you go. <laughs> but yeah, no, that's like my favorite thing. So anything you want, I'll help. Huh. Um, but yeah, I mean, let's see. 
So you have, uh, besides that, do you have any like series or anything that you're going to be coming out talking about or anything like that? No, I just, cause I really got to get on my YouTube again. Um, Facebook monetized me recently. And so I, I, I promised myself and my wife and everyone around me, I was going to just put as many, I was going to disperse as many eggs in multiple baskets as I could. And then whichever one caught fire first, whichever one started hatching first, essentially, I said, okay, I'm going to double down on that one a bit so that I can reinvest that money into the things that really need it, but aren't going. Right. Um, so I just got to get on YouTube. Yeah. I got to do a lot more YouTube. Which Same. speaking of Zach here finally got his, his hundredth follower. So now Drop he has, unique URL, man, let me tell you that those, that first hundred <laughs> hard first thousands harder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. YouTube shorts will shoot you way up hot, faster than you I, can imagine. I just do not have the patience to do short stuff. So, I, yeah. so um, there's a thing about that with me. Because I started on TikTok, my sanctification process was happening while I was blowing up on TikTok. So I started repurposing my TikToks for other things. I would snatch off the watermark and then blow it up with text and that was going on Instagram, Facebook, and then YouTube was like, we're doing shorts too. And I'm like, I am not about to disperse it three different directions, or I guess I am. And then I just started putting a few on there. But <sighs> I hate that everyone's trying to follow the TikTok thing because I'm trying to get away from TikTok and it's following me. Every TikTok day. sucks. <laughs> I, I mean so I've actually broke 50,000 followers. And I'm be honest with you, I told you this, Cam, this is how I feel about it. I don't feel much different than when I had 30,000. Yeah. Just uh, <laughs> you, you I'm so know, busy everywhere else. I'm like, we, it's cool. <laughs> we got to be humble. Like, there's friends of mine who I made early on in TikTok who I still love and keep in touch with, and they're still sitting at 400 followers because it's just not their thing. You know, yeah. I know good pastors. One of my dudes, redneck pastor, he's a good pastor. I know a couple of Pastor Brian, few other friends of mine I've made that <laughs> they haven't been banned. I made other friends, every other friend of mine have been banned. TikTok ban you for, because, you know, whatever. It's stupid. It's yeah. stupid. It's terrible. There's no um, yeah, review I, process. I am approaching the time I got to wake my wife up and I got to get ready for work. Okay. Let's, so, yeah, let's wrap it up then. So, um, I don't so know how now, you guys are doing with time, but I'm running out. No, you're now, good. now for then for Cam's last most important question, which yes. we all love, what the yeah. show is all about. Question for Israel, which I'm actually interested to hear too. All right. So okay. <laughs> around, around the rebranding of the show, was a dark time in American history, you know, COVID and all that. Uh, a lot of people, I, I knew uh, a friend of mine's brother uh, took his own life after losing a job and getting back, back into drugs because he lost his job due to COVID. Um, and there was just a lot of desperation, a lot of depression in that I'd noticed. And a lot of people saying a lot of violent things that I didn't understand. And I felt the call for this show to be one of hope. Which, you know, of course, the primary hope for me and the one that I mentioned more than anything else is the resurrection. That's the big hope. Um, but what I wanted to do with every episode is have every time someone comes on, they have to answer this question, which I may okay. ask, I, I may ask Coop again just just for fun. Uh, yeah. But um, uh, to help those out, people who are in dire straits, what is something in your life it could be personal? global, anywhere in between, uh, what's something that gives you the hope and the motivation to carry on? What's your, what's, what's this little silver lining to hold on to? Look at God the hamster wheel. Go on, go on. God doesn't just meet you at where you are. God doesn't meet you where you are. Excuse me. When you are initially saved, he meets you where you're at every single day, every day. Wherever you're at, he meets you right there. And he may not, you know, he, he may not care whether or not you love the band Kansas, right? Okay. Maybe yeah, God will use I don't know. But what I do know is this God will use things like you wouldn't believe and gives them a little life. You know how scripture will jump out at you? Here's my daughter's baby wipes. If God wanted to, he will make these words jump out to get my attention. Easy water bottle. I've had God do that. And there's a little bit of life, a little bit of, I don't like to say magic because it sounds paganistic, but it's like, it just comes up just for me. Yeah. Just for me. And if 
we take into account there's no such thing as coincidences. You will see the everyday things that God is putting right in front of you and you just don't see it. Start noticing because he loves you more than you would ever believe. Right. Well, and I think that for me, there it could be anything like you said, but there's this feeling of, oh, there you yeah. are. There you are. Absolutely. I love you. I, mean, I, I, I love you. You know, and it's that beautiful because, you know, that's what he's he's saying. God will use whatever language he needs yep. in your everyday life to get your attention, to let you know how much he loves you. Except for Nicki Minaj songs. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, he might. I don't know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, beyond that, I was just going to tell, I don't know if you have special, you, you said you didn't have special URLs before, but just search Izzy Centric, I-Z-Z-Y-C-E-N-T-R-I-C, anywhere right and they'll find you yep. so you don't have a podcast do you not yet but eventually i want to kind of there was this uh radio show where the guy would actually talk about paranormal experiences i'm forgetting his name oh man I, i'm forgetting his name but he was real big on ufos and i i always love the idea of having like a paranormal podcast where it was just really really scary spooky stuff but because it's christians on the show or at least hosted by one I love the idea of, okay, hey, there's some light at the end of this tunnel, no matter where this goes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's what, that's, so, that's what you're shooting for, man. So eventually, but no. Um, now, my handle is Izzy Centric. Uh, YouTube automatically converted it to that because that was my URL. So thank God for that. Um, yeah, yeah it's they, they, straight across they, the board. They said they have handles now, and I'm like, I don't know what, the, what good this does me. I have a URL. Like... <laughs> I think you can tag people kind of like like kind of like Twitter handles. Okay. You I'm can sure. tag people in videos. In the title, you'll actually see their name pop up when you do that. And it's actually clickable oh. when you go open it up. I'm pretty sure it's how it works. That's that's actually fun. That motivates me to want to like drop some duets on the <laughs> anyway. Uh but yeah, so I mean as as except for that, uh thank you so much for coming on. Go go wake up your wife. Hopefully she's she's not astral projecting because otherwise she might she might wake you up. Thankfully no more. Yeah, thankfully not <laughs> that anymore. That was scary. I I didn't like that phase of our life together. It didn't know. <laughs> Thank Whatever. you so much. Let's do this again. I have a question for you that I'll I'll just send you offline. By the way, uh, that that Instagram group chat is just where I'm going to start talking all the time now. You're, Don't blame you. It's a good place. All of us. We we have fun. If you work your way into the inner circle around here, you can have fun in our in our Instagram chat as well. <laughs> Sweet, thank you so much. I'll uh, I appreciate you, and we'll see you later. All right, see you guys. Bye. All right. So for the rest of you, um, I don't have much to tell you in the way of what's coming up because I'm still solidifying December. I do have some real cool stuff coming, but you'll have to wait. Um, all I'm going to tell you is that the last episode of November, which is going to be the Tuesday before Thanksgiving, because I don't think anyone's going to want to take a break from family uh, to watch me. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be come uh, on now. <laughs> Life and death is in the tongue. <laughs> you but, want to watch this show? What What else are you going to watch? Watch football and then watch the mad ones. Yeah. Come on now, try it out. Watch the uh, mad ones. But uh, it will be uh, next Tuesday. We're having Justin Marler back on the show. Um, you're welcome to come if you'd like to be a part of that conversation. We'll, we'll see. Wasn't he the guest that you had with Professor Gray? Or or is this somebody? No, 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 no. no I guess I haven't met him. No, uh, but I did. I did have the guest co-host Buck is may or may not come. I haven't spoken to him, but he did mm. accept the invitation. So we'll, we'll, see. Buck, we'll see. Buck Johnson may be on there as well. I'll be watching. I'll tell you that right now. Um, but you're welcome to come on, even especially if, if it's up. Thanksgiving. <laughs> so it'll be next Tuesday. Uh, beyond that, like I said, join the back Black Tank Club, which I even got a special URL. If you go to blacktankclub.com, it'll take you right to the shirts. Take you right to it. So just do that. Um, if you want any, well, it, it honestly all goes to the same shop. So you just click around and find the other ones. But if you want to go directly to the shop, we're the madones.com slash store. Um, if you would like to um, support the show, which is just supporting my poor butt. Um, you can do that at patreon.com slash the mad ones. Uh, like I, I already told you about this. I'm on Twitter at ham Carlos. Uh, Zach is on TikTok at the muted flag and Instagram. And have you set up your URL yet? I 
I think so. <laughs> I, yeah, it should be it should be at the muted flag. If you look on YouTube for the muted flag, I'll Sweet. pop up. Any anywhere else you want to tell people to find you? Is that good? No, that's it right now. Uh, I know you were trying to talk me into uh, Twitter, and we'll see. Twitter's the best, and you'll you'll see the <laughs> the mean side of me. I mean, um, you know. <laughs> well, I guess I'm kind of mean to random masons on TikTok. So mm, they um, deserve it, though. If you're listening and you'd rather watch, please join us on on YouTube. I'd love to grow the video side of this guy. I put a lot of work into all of this, and I'd like you to see it. youtubecom slash Uh, We're also on basically every other video platform. So if you want to find me on, um, uh, what's that one called? Rumble. I'm on that. If you want to find it on um, Odyssey, the old episodes are on Odyssey. And we are also on Rockfin for video. If you're watching and you'd rather not see uh, Zach's face, uh, you can go over to <laughs> your favorite podcatcher. Just type in the Mad Ones. Uh, sometimes it's easier to add in my name or the guest's name just because uh, there's a musical by the same name, and I hate I hate them for that. And you know, don't listen to a musical for God's sake. Musicals are awful. Uh, but yeah, so any podcatcher. The mad ones. I, li I like. I like. Music. I'm gonna listen to the Mad Ones musical just to spite you. <laughs> <laughs> I hate musicals. I'm just kidding. I like. I, don't I like them, but I, that's out of character. I thought you would love musicals, but uh, anyway. dude, the fact that there is one person in one city singing out of a window and another person, this is so autistic of me. I'm not autistic, but this is very autistic. The, um, someone in another city singing the rest of the lyrics or anyone. I, I just, you, I hate you it. can't look, listen, I'm going to make a flat earth style statement, right? You know, I'm not a flat earther, but I'm going to make a flat earth style statement, right? You can't say you hate musicals and say you love the Bible. The Bible is a musical. Okay. Moses breaks out of, out of somebody else said this before me and I didn't come up with it, but basically once they get freed, what happens? Moses sings. Miriam sings, but it doesn't mean I have to enjoy it. There's like, songs every other minute in the Bible. Yeah, the Bible that, is basically a musical. Right, but the whole thing is basically a musical. But it doesn't sound like a musical, and I hate. That. <laughs> Just, I hate that sound. You know, oh somebody else okay. came up with that, not me, and I don't remember who it was. But I got to give, give credit for credit. <laughs> Beyond that, thank you for for joining me again, Coop. It's been a pleasure. Been uh, a pleasure. And and for the rest of you, we'll be back. I'll be back next week. You may be with us. We'll find out. Co-host at large. We'll see. Uh, and beyond that, uh, I've got nothing. So uh, you have a chance to be a light in the world. So go light it up. <laughs>